All right. Hey, welcome everybody. We are here tonight. With, joined with uh, for our Central Texas Mycology Society monthly lecture series. Uh, we are joined tonight by Alex Moore from Mushroom Revival, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the healing power of fungi and, and a little bit about the science behind it. So, if you want to kind of introduce yourself, Alex, and kind of take it away from you. Great. Thanks for having me. This is uh, awesome, and what a time to connect in the mycelial interwebs on video. This is great that we can tune in from all over the world and different time zones and, and different locations and vibe out about the love for mushrooms. I'm Alex Dore and the Wood Wide Web, exactly. I'm Alex Dore. I am the founder, CEO, and president of Mushroom Revival. And we're a functional mushroom company and I personally am obsessed with the healing power of mushrooms, so I'm super excited. Everyone is tuning in and shrooming in. Uh, we got the mushroom family together, and it's growing by the day. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If if you haven't, maybe you're you're joining, you're new. Uh, I, I would love to hear where everyone is from, and if you have any topics that you want me to dive in uh, to and and to talk about. We have lots of of uh, interest in lion's mane. So definitely we'll, we'll touch upon lion's mane because that is the topic of tonight. And if you are open, I would love to start with a little fungal meditation to kind of uh, create a space where we can dive in and connect with mushrooms and fungi and to each other. Yeah, sounds great. Let's do it. So if you are sitting, you know, maybe adjust your, your uh, position and get comfortable. Take a few deep breaths, drink a water. If you want to close your eyes, you can. And pretend you are the start of mycelium, the roots of a mushroom. As you breathe, mycelium grows out from where you're sitting to all four corners of the room that you're in. As you breathe, picture this mycelium growing to the building that you're in, whether it's apartment or house. As you breathe, Picture that mycelium growing out into the town or the city that you're, you're currently in. Growing ever more to the state that you're in. And we have a lot of people tuning in from Texas. So we already have a lot of those mycelial webs interconnecting out into the United States into Canada, Mexico, and beyond. To the whole world is covered in this mycelial web, all interconnecting. Humans, animals, fungi, bacteria. Everything on this planet Earth is connected. As you breathe, this mycelial web is growing ever more past the moon, Mars, Saturn, our whole solar system is covered in this mycelial web. As it grows, the Milky Way galaxy, until the whole universe is an interconnected mycelial web. Now focus on a hyphae, one tip of a mycelial thread back to the Milky Way galaxy, to our solar system, to planet Earth, to the United States, to the state that you're in, to the city or town, to the building that you're in right now, to the room that you're in, 
and then back to your body. Focus on the feeling on your skin, to the muscles, to your bones, to your heart, and feel that connection to fungi. As we're breathing, every breath that we take, we're breathing in thousands of spores of mushrooms. And we share over 50% of our DNA with, with fungi. We are the ancestors of fungi. And so thank you for loving fungi as much as I do and for entertaining that little activity. I'm gonna turn it over to share my screen. Can y'all see my screen? Yeah, it looks like it's working. Awesome. That was a nice little meditation there. Thank you. For some reason, Full screen is not working. Let's try to present. There we go. So thanks for tuning in to the healing power of mushrooms and fungi. If you are in this group, group, you're tuning in, you're shrooming in, you already probably know how incredible fungi are to healing, to making the world a better place. Mushrooms and fungi come in all shapes and sizes and colors and can really be unbelievably beautiful as we're walking in the woods and discovering the hidden potential of fungi. They can be big and small. To the right is a mushroom I found in Ecuador and it was actually one of the biggest mushrooms of its set. Um, and it was, <laughs> I took the picture of this one because it was the only one that would actually focus with my camera. The other ones were too small. As I said before, we share over 50% of our DNA with fungi and we're actually more closely related to fungi than we are to plants. We breathe in oxygen, let out CO2, whereas plants, uh, breathe in CO2, let out oxygen. And we actually have to eat food just like fungi, whereas plants make their food. To really understand the healing power of mushrooms, we have to understand the story of mushrooms in, in the context of history of the universe. About a billion years ago, fungi appeared on earth, or that was the oldest fungi that we have found so far. And I have a feeling that we're going to find older and older specimens. About 7 million years ago, quote unquote, humans, our early ancestors appeared, and it was unknown who really was the first organism to have their first relationship with fungi. There's a theory that fungi came from space. Now, this, this theory is called panspermia. And time and time again, we see this unbelievable resilience of fungi. And it's not too far-fetched, this idea that they came and survived from you know, spores living in an asteroid and hitting early planet Earth. This is the actual picture that I took uh, of the asteroid hitting the earth as just right time and place, you know, and got lucky with this picture. S some of the examples of the resilience of fungi, uh, you know, some, some scientists were doing some, some under the ocean drilling of uh, some, some rock samples and trying to discover life under the ocean. They found 
69 different fungi living beneath the Pacific Ocean. And one species of fungi, you know, they, they put these rock samples on petri plates and gr- tried to grow the fungi out. One species, what's a schizophilum uh, fungi, and they found it was over 20 million years old. Not only did the mycelium grow, but it fruited a mushroom. This is like finding seeds of an apple tree underneath the ocean that were 20 million years in hibernation, putting it in soil. Not only does it grow an apple tree, but actual apples that you can pick from the tree. This is pretty significant, and it just shows how resilient fungi are uh, as extremophiles. We can find many different types of fungi in Antarctica, out of all places, and even in the snow. So when uh, I, I saw one person was from Denver, Colorado, I don't know if you have any snow right now, but there might be fungi living in that snow. Even Chernobyl, where it's unbelievably radioactive, Researchers have found dozens of different types of fungi that use this radiation as a sole food source. So if the asteroid is in space for maybe 20 million years floating through outer space, not only do we know that it can survive, but it can actually use the radiation in space as a food source. Now, some researchers actually took a piece of lichen, uh, a symbiotic relationship between cyanobacteria and a few different types of fungi, and threw it out of a space station. Uh, about six months later, they, they brought it back on board. It continued growing like nothing happened. So fungi can survive in space. And I'll get a little more into this a little later of some of the future um, projects that, that humans are using um, for this, this application. Hey, Alex, we got a question from YouTube. Uh, what substrates were available in Antarctica? So like, were those fungi that they found growing or were they finding just spores in the snow? Because some researchers in Antarctica have built wooden structures for research, Uh, Some fungi have been found to degrade some of that wood. Uh, Other fungi, I believe they're filamentous, have been found growing in snow. Um, I could be wrong. It could be just the spores. But I know that filamentous fungi have been found degrading the wood structures of researchers' uh, cabins, so to speak. Could that have come in on the wood, though, I guess? It could. But, I mean... It's still growing down there, which is pretty amazing. Exactly, exactly. It's pretty cold. Yeah, and there's there's an insect there, and it's, I, I believe, the only insect in Antarctica, and I'm waiting for them to find an entomopathogenic fungi on that insect, which is a fungi that attacks insects. And I'm waiting for a researcher to find it, but who knows? Uh, maybe it'll happen, maybe not. But 3.5 billion years ago, we had these... Um, I'm going to butcher the name, stroma, uh, stromatolites, possibly. Stromatolites. Stromatolites, there you go. And they're cyanobacterial mounds, basically. And this was the first evidence of life, terrestrial life, uh, growing outside of the water. Now, you know, a few billion years later, we get the oldest fungi ever found. And this was actually found a few years ago, so not that long ago, I think the oldest fungi before this was like 360 million years old or or 460 million years old or something like that. So to find this fungi that's a billion years old is astounding. And it really just reorients our understanding of how life developed on earth. About 700 million years ago, we get love on the rocks. We get lichen. And this is this symbiotic relationship between this cyanobacteria and a couple types of fungi. And this, I believe, is the first example of symbiosis, uh, true symbiosis between multiple organisms on terrestrial uh, land. 
And interestingly, mycorrhizal fungi developed before early land plants um, by 30 million years. And the development of mycorrhizal fungi, which are fungi that attach to the roots of plants, they are incredibly important for this time era in transforming or terraforming early rocky life uh, or rocky landscapes into soil that we see today. About 430 million years ago, we get these structures called prototaxides. And when they were first found, they didn't know what they were. Um, was it a, a fossil or was it a, an, a bone? Was it a, um, a rock? I don't know. Um, they did cross sections of this structure and it almost looks like rings of a tree, right? And they did DNA analysis and they figured out it was 90% fungi and about, you know, five to 10% this cyanobacteria or this photosynthetic organism. So this was the precursor of early trees, which I think uh, makes the most sense. And so when these early plants are developing, we get mycorrhizal fungi, and they are going from being above ground to really digging below ground and, and secreting enzymes and uh, just their, their penetration through this rocky landscape is creating the soil that we see today. The mycorrhizal is, uh, fungi is connecting these, these land plants and, and creating this wood wide web, uh, this, this internet of the early forests on planet Earth. About 420 million years ago, we get arthropods or insects um, uh, starting to come on land. And what they're doing is, is creating these underground habitats and further creating the soil that we see today. Now, during you know, some of the seven mass extinctions, these arthropods or insects survived underneath the ground and survived eating roots of plants and the fungi. And they used that as their sole food source and then dead arthropods that didn't make it. And what do you think is a defense mechanism of these plants and these fungi? They obviously don't want these insects uh, to be eating them. So they start secreting all these crazy compounds. One of them, ergotamine. Uh, one of the precursors to LSD, some of these compounds, including psilocybin, are obviously psychedelic. And they have interesting effects on these insects. Um, some of them are uh, hunger suppressants. And while these, these uh, insects, whether they're termites, they're, they're eating the wood or the roots or the fungi, if they have the psilocybin or ergotamine or, or other things, they, uh, they stop being hungry. So they stop eating and it gives fungi uh, the upper hand and these plants the upper hand. And I think this was the development for entomopathogenic fungi or cordyceps as most people know it as, or fungi that attack insects. So it went from this compound biological warfare to actually infecting and getting into the cell walls of, or the, uh, into um, th these insects and, and uh, actually growing off these insects. So that was a huge leap for fungi uh, to be able to learn a new food source. And we see a lot of these insects actually contain psilocybin and other compounds which influence the insects. Uh, this is Massospora, which has gotten a lot of publicity lately, and it not only secretes some amphetamine compounds, but also psilocybin into the cicada. And so as this is happening and we, we're getting a lot of you know tripping insects, we get the development of fleshy uh, mushrooms, as, as you know, of a mushroom that you see in the grocery store, just the typical cap and stem, or, you know, there's tons of morphologies, but branching from this mycorrhizal connection, we get fungi, I, I think really 
maturing and growing up and saying, hey, you know, I love this symbiotic relationship and I'm ready to break apart and, you know, um, start uh, having a whole life cycle with insects or a whole life cycle without uh, this, this relationship with plants. Around the same time, you know, our early ancestors are, are coming about and I have a theory, there's many theories of how early humanoids evolved. And obviously, the development of psilocybin was not to increase uh, the evolution of early humanoids. It was actually to suppress insect behavior um, and control insects. Now, our early ancestors actually ate insects as, as one of the main protein sources. And so I feel like, you know, I, I have a hunch that our early ancestors not only found some of these insects, which had psilocybin secreted into them or, or gotamine or uh, some amphetamine compounds and actually tripped out. Um, and then probably on the same timeline, we get some other early humanoid ancestors eating mushrooms that contain the psilocybin themselves and not the insects, which these mushrooms contain the psilocybin to, again, control these insects. So we get this stoned ape theory that our early ancestors, you know, whether we're hunters and gatherers, we're following animals and we're following the dung, what grows off dung, mushrooms. And some of those mushrooms contain psilocybin or, or biocystin, nor biocystin, psilocin, other uh, entheogenic compounds. And that kind of burst our evolution um, and, and was, was the, the fire under our butts to evolve. And so uh, imagine being, you know, an, an early ape and eating, you know, you're hungry, you're, you're following an animal for, for so many days, and you're just eating berries and, and things to sustain yourself. And so you eat some mushrooms and you're not even expecting to trip out. This is before we developed language. And so to have this profound experience and not be able to express it verbally is really profound. And to not really understand possibly where this is coming from or why this is happening or what this experience is. There's a theory by Terrence McKenna uh, that he lays out in Food of the Gods that this was really our start to develop language and, and uh, cognitive reasoning and religion and, and so many other aspects of what makes modern humans modern humans. So these two pieces of art are by Alex Gray, kind of depicting... Uh, some of these theories. One, one of the theories is actually Adam and Eve. Uh, it wasn't an apple, it was a mushroom. And um, we'll never know if that's true, but it's a, a beautiful piece of art. Uh, you can see in the lower left-hand corner, and uh, they're actually both holding this Amanita muscaria. And uh, this propels us into uh, early um, evolution as, as Homo sapiens. 17,000 BC, we get the Red Lady of El Miron, and she was in Spain, I believe. Um, if I'm not mistaking, I could be wrong. And she was found with spores of two different types of mushrooms in her teeth. And so this proves that this is the early, earliest record of human consumption of fungi, but I believe it, it dates back way before that. We get the earliest piece of art depicting humans uh, and our, our love or connection with fungi. This is a Tessaly cave drawing in northern Algeria, and we get this, this bee shaman, this, this combination of a, a mushrooms, a human, and a bee all coming together. And it's interesting because as early humanoids you know, migrated from Ethiopia to northern climates, it's getting colder and colder. And as early humanoids are developing, we're losing our ability to make our own serotonin. And so as it's getting colder, we get less vitamin D, we get less sunlight. 
you know, we get, I, I feel like we get the, the earliest signs of SADS or, or seasonal depressive disorder. Um, and, you know, we need a way to not only connect with this divinity, um, but also, you know, as an early antidepressive drug. And so, you know, as, as humans are migrating up north, these mushrooms don't tend to grow unless they're, you know, Amanita muscaria. And so one way to preserve these mushrooms instead of, you know, you could dry them, but you could also preserve them in honey. And this was, you know, the beginning of mead and alcohol. Um, but I can see this as, a, you know, uh, one example of how bees, humans and mushrooms come together. 4,000 BC, we get uh, some more um, rock paintings of uh, mushrooms. In Spain, uh, 3,300 BC, we get Otzi or Utzi, the Iceman, in the Swiss Alps, and he was the, the oldest naturally preserved human on the planet, and he was found with two types of mushrooms, the birch polypore um, on the top right and the tinder conch on the bottom left. He was using, or it was a it was uh, theorized that he was using the birch polypore to clear intestinal parasites. And then the bottom mushroom, the tinder conch, to carry around embers of a fire um, and also make clothing. You can, you can mash it down into kind of a myco leather. Um, and then also he was found with early uh, tattoos on meridian points around his body. And they theorized that he was using the smoldering mushroom as moxibustion um, and putting the heat of the burning mushroom underneath the different meridian points to relieve an early form of arthritis. And they actually consulted some traditional Chinese medicine doctors and acupuncturists, and they said that, yeah, the points on his body that he had tattoos correlate with points that help with arthritis. Um, so that's pretty interesting. In Egypt, we get many depictions of mushrooms. This is one of them of, you know, a mushroom head. There's a lot of folklore of mushrooms emerging. They were kind of um, gifts from the gods and they came down with, from lightning. Um, we get some more cave or rock uh, art of mushrooms and a mushroom headed people in Siberia. And we get a lot of these mushroom sculptures um, all around um, South and Central America. Uh, and it's not only, you know, um, I don't think it's like, I like mushrooms. It's, it's really a deep religious, um, almost sacred act to depict these mushrooms in this way, or, or at least that's my, uh, th that's what I want, want to think. We'll never know, um, but it, it seems to be more, more sacred as it is just kind of, oh, mushrooms are cool. And a lot of these mushroom stones are, you know, in, in burial sites and, um, you know, with Atsi or Utsu the Iceman, Obviously, if he was found with two mushrooms on his body when he died, it was pretty important for survival. Um, so it's it's just going up beyond, oh, I like to throw some button mushrooms in a stir fry every once in a while. It's means of survival and um, the the basis of of religion. Um, this is actually a a uh, what do you call it? A, to the left, this is actually in in China um, at. Uh, a reishi museum, and this is a, it's not real, it's a, it's a, a mock-up, um, but these stones have, have actually been taken, a lot of them were in Guatemala, and they've been taken, and they're actually all around the world now, um, but uh, hopefully they, they return back to where they were taken, but we get a lot, not only this, this sacred, um, uh, rituals with mushrooms, uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms, but also other mushrooms are added in. In so a lot of uh, corunderos, corunderas in in Mexico uh, use a lot of different species of psilocybin with uh, deer truffles and these 
cordyceps species and using them as sort of this, this concoction or this mixture, which I think is similar to ayahuasca of uh, MAOI uh, mixed with this entheogen. We get depictions in Greece, and this was uh, the formation of our early uh, kind of relationship with LSD. And we get the Ulysses mysteries all wrapped up in our early use with um, psychedelic fungi and yeast. Hippocrates, the quote-unquote father of modern Western medicine, wrote extensively about fungi, specifically the agaricon mushroom, wrote about it as a cure-all, and then also wrote about fungi um, using them as moxibustion again, using you know the smoldering mushrooms uh, under specific meridian points to release chi or energy or blood flow um, to help different ailments and, and things like that. So around the turn of the century, uh, we get a lot of different mushrooms being written um, in text, uh, most in, in China. So in Shenong's Materia Medica, we get Bouveria bassiana, one of the, the notorious entomopathogenic fungi or quote unquote cordyceps species that attack insects that are used for pest control. They talk about it as a use for medicine. In 200 AD, uh, we get reishi and poria cocos, tremella, um, polyporus and bellitus, uh, and, and so many other types of fungi. Um, Cordyceps cicadiae is mentioned a ton. This is something that we, this is a, a, a species of mushrooms that we don't really talk about here in the United States. I'll get more into it later, but it's an incredible, incredible mushroom. Most people, when they think of cordyceps, a lot of people think of the ones that grow in Tibet off caterpillars growing out of their heads. This was listed in the Tibetan Materia Medica in the 8th century. And uh, we get in 800 AD, uh, we get cultivated red yeast, which is used as a medicine and, and later actually you, you, uh, turned into the statin drug mevastatin, and it's also used as a dye uh, to dye foods and um, other things. Uh, we get it now in, into the, I always mess this up, the 1900s, is that right? Uh, in 1918, we get a lot of drugs starting to be produced. So single compounds being isolated but from fungi and turned into pharmaceuticals. So we get you know, uh, ergotamine A for headaches. We get penicillin, uh, which is unbelievable. Alexander Fleming was the first to kind of um, uh, theorize this happening, but he wasn't actually the person who um, helped develop it uh, into, you know, worldwide um, uh, cure and saving, you know, millions and millions of lives. In 1938, we get LSD which is discovered and, and now we're kind of having a, a revival in the way we view LSD to uh, you know, treat addiction and, and all, all sorts of things. Um, and just more and more compounds are, are being isolated from all different types of fungi and used for pharmaceuticals. And this was kind of this hundred year span was really influential for drugs. Uh, it's, you know, I've heard a statistic that 40% of pharmaceuticals are derived from fungi. And honestly, it's not surprising. And we have barely tapped into the potential of fungi. We have barely discovered, you know, um, I've heard 5% of all fungi on the planet. And, you know, I, be I believe that eventually we, most of our pharmaceuticals are going to be derived from fungi. Um, it, it, and if not fungi plants, this is a, sh a very short list of just a few different compounds that were made into really popular billion, multi-billion dollar drugs. And so we get like cyclosporin A from tolipocladum and flatum. If you are going to get an organ transplant, you, you will probably be administered cyclosporin A. 
and you know many many different other compounds and and we could see psilocybin and LSD are actually on this list and we're seeing this this revolution now of psilocybin really entering the mainstream or about to and i i feel like that is going to be one of the greatest moments in human history for the healthcare industry um, but just this short list over 30 billion dollars in just in 2017 alone and the mushroom market is 50 billion dollars just to put that in perspective so a little bit more about me um where uh, i i wasn't born yet for all these these different things but i i really got into fungi uh, because of my own mental health and and illnesses i had crippling depression and anxiety growing up and um have attempted suicide a few times and and abused drugs and really had had a rough patch for a while and it, first semester of college someone handed me a full solo cup worth of magic mushrooms dried and i asked them okay how much you know it was orientation week and they're like if you eat this whole entire cup i will give it to you for free and that was my actually first time eating psilocybin mushrooms and I didn't know what a dose was or a no, normal amount. And so I ate it. And for people maybe, you know, who have never taken psilocybin mushrooms, a whole solo cup is a lot, especially for your first time and unbelievably ego shattering. The whole concept of need just did not exist anymore. And uh, just, from that point, flushed all the, the pharmaceuticals I was on down the toilet and really just transformed my life. And it really just put this lore and this uh, admiration for fungi at, uh, in the spotlight. And it wasn't until later that I got diagnosed with Lyme disease. And I was bedridden, had painful joints, brain fog, the whole thing, that I turned back to fungi. And and I found unbelievable relief. I, I tried doxycycline. I tried the whole, you know, pharmaceutical route of of Lyme disease, um, Western Lyme disease approach. It didn't work. It actually, made me feel worse. Using fungi, uh, mushrooms, and and different herbs, um, it just turned my life a whole 180. So from that point, I was like, all right, signing my life away to fungi to mushrooms. I got every single book I could off Amazon and at every local bookstore and signed up for every class that I could, any internship. You don't have to pay me, you know, I'll, I'll go wherever you are and, and uh, just learn. Um, started going out in the woods and looking for every single mushroom I could, buying grow kits just to uh, figure it out and fail forward and, and figure out what is up with fungi and why are people not talking about it? So this was my first internship at Aloha Medicinals, a mycelium on grain uh, manufacturer, and they do a lot of wholesale. And so I learned a lot of lab skills, you know, how to culture fungi and grow spawn and, you know, the ins and outs of a mushroom business uh, on like an industrial scale. And I learned a lot. And this was huge. This was like diving into the deep end um, and had this huge admiration for functional mushrooms. And they were growing a lot of cordyceps mycelium at the time. And this was in early, either late 2014 or early 2015. And they were trying to, um, their emphasis was on the mycelium. So the roots of the mushrooms, they weren't actually growing the, the actual mushrooms that, that people know, but it was, it was unbelievable uh, experience to, to get in the field. Right after that, I went to Ecuador on a, a field study to learn about uh, biodiversity in different ecosystems and the anthropogenic effect on them. So the human effect on these ecosystems and biodiversity and got really into ata ants or leaf cutter ants. And they are one of the most sustainable fungal farmers on the planet. They only take a, a small fraction of leaves from trees. They take off this little bit. And it's unbelievable to, to watch them um, in their, their lines. And a lot of times they'll have a, an ant uh, riding on the leaf and kind of giving directions to the, the ant carrying it. And they'll, they'll, 
they'll get back to their nest. They'll they'll uh, munch up these leaves, and they'll grow mycelium on it, and they'll eat the mycelium. And it's super sustainable. They're uh, we found that the biggest nest that we we're we're studying was bringing in over 1,900 grams per day. That's fit, over 1,500 pounds of leaves that they're they're turning into fungi uh, every year. Just one nest, and there's nests everywhere. So this is giving nutrients back to the soil. It's it's this amazing symbiotic relationship. And what I found at my internship is a lot of mushroom farmers, if you're familiar, use a lot of plastic. And they're single-use plastic. You throw them away, and it's kind of like the skeleton of the closet for any mushroom farmer out there. Um, and a lot of it, you know, is is in the U.S. And, and, and it's well, I, I shouldn't say that. It's it's us humans learning um, how to grow fungi sustainably. And um, so I saw this. I was like, wow, there's no plastic. You just you just grow it in the ground and you chew up some leaves. This is this is amazing. This is super sustainable, and it really inspired me. Um, but I also saw this other side of insects and fungi, uh, entomopathogenic fungi, or a lot of people know it as cordyceps. And they're mushrooms that grow out or fungi that attack insects or arthropods. And a lot of people, you know, especially in the space, they, you know, get really inspired by mushrooms and fungi. And they think it's like this really rainbow, really like, uh, really positive, like let's all act like fungi. They're they're super they're super symbiotic and and uh, they work together with so many different organisms. And then you get entomopathogenic fungi, which just like destroy insects. And it's this funny other side of fungi that a lot of people don't talk about of death and decay and this gnarly aspect of fungi and mushrooms that is not pretty, but I think it's so cool and. It's right out of science fiction film. This is the first entomopathogenic fungi that I found on a weevil, and just unbelievable. And and you know I would always stay back in the group and look on the undersides of leaves and find all these different fungi. And this is in the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador, so you can find all these different kinds. My the leader of the group. Uh, Jeff Gallus, he was a professional photographer and got amazing shots of, of these entomopathogenic fungi. So, you know, these are just some that we found on all different types of insects. We were on San Cristobal Island, um, uh, part, one of the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador, and this was a parasitic. We were, uh, if anyone knows anything about the Galapagos, it's, it's overrun by invasive species. Um, and the native species just hasn't had a chance to adapt. And so these really invasive plant species have come and animal species and just eradicated the, the native populations of plants and, and animals and things like that. So we're doing kind of replanting services and planting, replanting native plants back. And we found this, this wasp with mushrooms just popping up all over it. And... I asked one of the, the local uh, people and he said, oh yeah, that's a parasitic wasp. And it's actually, you know, we don't want it uh, around here. And it was this really interesting moment I had of, all right, here's a parasite on a parasite on a native plant fighting invasive plants. And this, it really just blew up my, my simple perspective of, of, you know, ecosystems and, and it's not, black and white. It's not crystal clear. It's, it's really complex and there's many, many different layers of how it works. And it's all a matter of perspective. You know, what is a parasite? What does symbiotic mean um, to the overall ecosystem and, you know, compared to, to what? And this goes back to the Tessaly cave drawings um, of this bee uh, with these mushrooms and this human uh, which was me in that that instance, uh, and this was a piece of art by Martin Bridge, of this beautiful symbiosis of all these different organisms coming together, and he weaved in our our current logo at the bottom, which was awesome. Um, really awesome artist. He actually did the cover of my book. I, I would check him out. He's really incredible. He's in 
Western Massachusetts uh, is really kick-ass. So this this really got to me. And and when I was in Ecuador, this is actually my second time going, and and each time I notice this unbelievable, this just heart wrenching, depressing uh, view of humans just destroying ecosystems and. Uh, there's a region of Ecuador, which is actually the most biodiverse region on the planet, the most amount of organisms in uh, a, a small square footage. And you see, you know, um, oil uh, refineries and uh, miners and people cutting down trees left and right. And, and it's really depressing. And um, it really propelled me to make a difference, um, you know, there's there's a lot of really inspiring people in the micro community, like Paul Stamets is one of them, that really preach this this you know mushroom can save the planet, and I I hope that everyone tuning in has this this philosophical drive to to make the world a better place and and to really have a positive impact. Um, I know I do, and I um, con- constantly up at night and 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 uh, meditating on how, how do we how do we make the world a better place. And so this propelled me to write uh, the Microremediation Handbook and how we degrade toxic waste with fungi and, and filter uh, uh, toxins with fungi. You can actually get this book for free, um, the PDF version. I, I won't accept any money for it because I, I feel like it, it's knowledge that everyone needs to have and deserves. And I'm, I don't want to take any money for it. Um, I did in the beginning and I, I just made the decision that it, it needs to be free, um, and I'll, I'll get more into that later. But um, I, I was actually smoking cigarettes at the time, and that was part of my – when I was getting into fungi, I was like, okay, I have this, all these bad habits. Um, for me personally, like tobacco is an evil. I don't want to vilify it. It's a beautiful plant. But for me, it wasn't healthy in the way I was using it in my relationship with tobacco. Um, and so I wanted to healthier – relationship with tobacco. And, and so I, I figured out, I, I saw a video from Peter McCoy and he was growing mushrooms off cigarette butts. And I did research and there's a ton of different research articles um, of, of all these researchers from around the world growing mushrooms on cigarette butts. I started to do it. I actually carried around a bucket with me, brought them to all these different festivals and and had people throw in their cigarette butts. I would walk around my college campus and have them throw it in uh, to, it was more phys- philosophical for me to kind of remediate my former bad habit um, and use psilocybin as a way to end that addiction uh, that my, my personal harmful relationship with tobacco. Now I have a, re- a healthier relationship with it and um, it's not addictive. Um, for me personally, but so I, I got a grant from the school and, and, uh, I was like, okay, great. You know, I, I figured out that they can grow on cigarette butts. And if anyone doesn't know, they're made out of cellulose acetate, which is a plasticized version of cellulose and cellulose is like, you know, a lot of the material plants and, um, fungi love cellulose, but this is like a, a form of plastic. So this is a way of degrading plastic in our environment. Um, and PAH is polycyc- polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are really toxic uh, compounds that leach out of um, ha- semi-burnt um, cigarette butts. Um, when, you, when you combust it, see all these this um, kind of like charcoal at the end? Um, PAHs are happen when you, you know, semi combust something. And so sent them into labs and found out that this oyster mushroom mycelium brought down these toxic PAHs almost below, uh, detectable limits in 14 days. Uh, it could be, it could have been in the first hour. I just tested it every 14 days, but it was, it was something that was like, wow, this is something that we need to scale up and do on a, a larger scale. I did all these tests. I didn't add it in here, but on enzymes that are produced by fungi. And so part of this test was using enzymes. 
which is kind of the metabolites. You could think of it as like the stomach acids of, of fungi. And they actually did way better, um, just the pure enzymes or the metabolites than the actual mycelium itself. And so I thought, wow, you know, in, let's cut the middleman and just get the enzymes. These enzymes can be harvested by huge bioreactors, similar to, to brewing beer, and you can harvest a huge amount of enzymes and make them shelf stable into a product that you can buy in a store. Um, or if you're a large scale bioremediation company, it's pretty easy to make a liquid solution. You can take a plane that's retrofitted for fighting forest fires, load it up with these enzymes that are uh, developed specifically for the toxin that you are um, trying to remediate and launch it over you know, an oil spill right when it happens or uh, a brownfield site or a super fun site, things like that. Um, I haven't seen this done, but I hope it does. And I hope someone does it because I would love to see this in action. This technology of microremediation is done on an industrial scale. It's actually really hard to do it on a grassroots scale, um, but it's really influential for specifically like dyes um, or uh, different, you know, liquid uh, li liquids from um, different industries, and and they'll they'll mix it in a bioreactor and remediate it. So this is was the cake of the cigarette butts with the oyster mushroom mycelium growing over it. And it actually produced oyster mushrooms seven times, seven flushes. And if anyone has ever grown oyster mushrooms, you're lucky if you get four, like that's pretty good, four flushes off the oyster mushrooms. And by the fourth flush, it starts to pitter out and they don't look as good. And you know, you won't get a good flush. This just kept going and kept going. And I got spores from this, this mushroom and developed this strain that was more adaptable to the toxins of the cigarettes. Around this time, um, I started finding Cordyceps militaris in the US. This was at um, one of the first mycosymbiotics festivals in Pennsylvania. And uh, they're awesome uh, mushrooms, Cordyceps militaris. They're little, little Cheetos. They grow on this um, this larva, and um, yeah, they're they're used as medicine, and it's it's kind of our version of that Tibetan cordyceps that grows off caterpillars. Around this time, I was dealing with Lyme disease and was looking for something that would help my energy levels. I was totally depleted of energy, and um, you know. Uh, Cordyceps have been grown for a while. Cordyceps and Militaris. Actually, they, the first uh, Cordyceps that were, Militaris that were grown was actually at Cornell University in 1895. And they grew like 16 different species of, of Cordyceps, which is unbelievable. Like I'm, I'm wondering like, where are we today? Because it just kind of died off. Like people just don't, do this anymore, um, which is interesting. And in 1932, first cordyceps grown on rice, and um, it, it started developing in the 1980s. We get like huge commercial production in China, uh, just growing millions and millions and millions of dried pounds of, of cordyceps, uh, militaris, and other cordyceps like cordyceps cicadiae and uh, and cordyceps guandangensis and all these different entomopathogenic fungi for medicine. It wasn't until 2015 that um, uh, Ryan Paul Gates uh, translated a video from Thai and uh, figured out how to grow it again in the US. It, I guess we had like a hundred year gap and um, it just kind of died out in the US and um, other farmers like William Padilla Brown and um, and Charlie Aller and, and all these other people started to grow it in the US. And now we, now we get a lot of people growing it and um, pretty, pretty awesome mushroom um, to grow. And we don't have many mushrooms that, are, that we cultivate here in the US, but we're getting there. And more mushrooms are starting to come into our culture and um, 
and into our awareness. Uh, this was my first grow setup in, uh, I think this is 2015. And this was like my own apothecary for my Lyme disease. And that's why I started growing it because I wanted something to help with my energy levels. Started growing it alongside weed in my basement. And uh, my roommate at the time was a, a cannabis grower. And so again, like I said before, mushrooms taken uh, oxygen let out CO2 and plants taken CO2 let out oxygen. So it was a great, amazing symbiotic relationship. Uh, cannabis actually needs it to be a lot hotter, um, whereas cordyceps likes it a lot colder. So didn't end up being the best symbiosis. But um, from my time in Ecuador, I was like trying to mimic symbiosis and started making my own like hydroponic systems and aquaponic systems and growing mushrooms in the same vicinity. So cycling that CO2 and oxygen and taking the spent substrate from the mushrooms, feeding that to worms, taking the worms, uh, feeding that to the fish, the fish would poop and pee, feed the plants, take the plant uh, scraps and, and uh, pasteurize it, grow mushrooms off of it, was trying to mimic you know, these uh, super biodiverse systems that I was seeing, you know, in Ecuador and, and a lot of other places. And as you can see, there's a lot of plastic and it was just, wasn't, um, it's, it looked really cool, but it, it wasn't as sustainable as I, I would hope. Um, and I realized that you really need to do it on a bigger scale, uh, to really mitigate those, um, uh, that kind of entry point. Does that make sense? Like you need a certain amount of unsustainability to enter, um, and then you need a certain amount of scale to make it sustainable. Um, so I was at the the uh, the scale that it probably wasn't sustainable for the amount of resources I was growing, but I had a lot of fun um, and learning a lot on how to grow mushrooms and plants and and algae and insects and fish and you know all these different things in the same environment. Um, trying to mimic what was outside, um, and a lot of times failed miserably, but learned learned a ton. And this was my first lab set up in man, I, I want to say early late 2017, and it was in my living room, as you can see. And I was sharing this house with uh, some roommates, and <laughs> I was just in the middle of the living room, you know, like cranking it out actually stayed after I graduated, I stayed in Massachusetts because I had access to this university lab. Um, I copied some keys and would sneak in there after hours and use their autoclave and their, their flow hood and, um, would have all these autoclaves, you know, around the house and, uh, what, you know, went from the living room to my dining room, to the kitchen, to the, to my room, to the basement, to the, the garage, to the shed. And at this point, my roommates were sick of me and they're like, all right, your mushroom thing is getting, is taking around the whole house and you need to find like an actual space. Um, this was like the four cookers that I used at the time. And this was the autoclave at the university. And, um, but I got it to work and I started growing, you know, I went from glass to these, um, plastic bottles that I, I could keep reusing over and over and over again. Um, so that was awesome. Um, going from the single use plastics to some that I can reuse over and over. Uh, if you've ever grown in glass bottle or just like have been around glass, you break it. These were awesome. I could chuck it across the room and it would just bounce. Um, so that was awesome for me as I scaled up to not have broken glass everywhere started, you know, I was like, all right, there's such a small surface area. I have to make it bigger. Um, and I came from a commercial mushroom background. So I wanted to grow on a larger scale. So I started growing in the typical filter bags that you can see, and these aluminum trays that I would fold, uh, to make this little growing environment. And then it would put a pan liner in, in that to, you know, have to make sure that the aluminum wouldn't leach into the substrate. Um, and it was just like so much waste, but it made great mushrooms. And at the same time, I, I moved into this Amish barn that used to be a furniture showroom. 
And it was such a steal. I mean, this was half the rent that per square foot of anything that I could find and utilities included, which was nuts as a mushroom farmer, like the amount of lights and just crazy equipment that were running 24 seven, um, until like a year later when they looked at the electric bill and they, uh, they upcharged me. But, um, for the first year I got a sweet deal and it's beautiful, beautiful wood barn and cordyceps. They, um, they grow in these containers. So you don't have to take them out to grow like a typical mushroom. So I didn't, I didn't care that it was wood. Um, I didn't have misters going or anything. So this is perfect space for me. Uh, this was like my first setup after I moved out of my basement and the walls were just made out of like plastic that I stapled to the wall and had these string lights, wires everywhere. These were actually shoe racks that I, uh, uh, nailed to these planks of wood and just like, uh, screwed in these little wheels. And it was just, you know, anything that I could do as cheaply as possible and was really scrappy, you know, and that's, you know, for anyone that's looking to start their own business or, you know, grow mushrooms, you, you got to start scrappy and fail forward. And, and that's how you got to do it. You see, like I used duct tape to close this bag. It really did, did not look pretty, but it worked uh, most of the time, a lot of time, a lot of failure unbelievable amount of failure but as you can see like you know all these different shapes that i was trying out i was trying all these different ways on how to cultivate because this is just such a new mushroom that these techniques really weren't widely available um, or at least i didn't have access to the techniques in china um, and thailand and, and things like that um, where they're growing like millions and millions of dry pounds so this is like a cake tin um, in just a plastic bag and uh, was the first person in the U.S. to grow cordyceps in a, in a monotub, um, typically used to grow uh, psilocybin or magic mushrooms. And they did really well. They did awesome. And then, and then they didn't. Um, but from this day, this was probably uh late 2017 early 2018 and this was like oh this is the way to grow on a larger scale um to kind of bridge that gap between sustainability and giving medicine to as many people it took me like six months to figure out there was a massive mushroom farm seven minutes up the road from our location i don't know why it took me that long but they reached out and they said, Hey, we have a 30 foot long autoclave. And this was like a big oven basically to sterilize the container. We're like, we don't use it on the weekends. If you want to use it, feel free. I almost had a heart attack. Like this is nuts. This is one of the biggest autoclaves, you know, in the country, just seven minutes up the road. And I didn't even know about it. And now I have access. I just have to pay, you know, a fee to use it. And I got way ahead of myself. And so I, I ordered all these stir light bins and I was like, why wouldn't it work? And, you know, it was 80 a, a, a batch. And I was like calling up stir light to get wholesale prices for these bins and like had to talk to these like mafia people that like, it's crazy. And, um, it didn't work. Uh, and so we ran like a few weekends in a row and, they take a few months before you realize if it's going to work or not. And we just became a trichoderma farm really quickly. And the bins started warping and, um, we decided that, you know, it'd be a great idea to, to use duct tape around the edge to make it airtight, the duct tape unstuck and bacteria just got in there. It, it sucked so hard. Um, when I hired my first employees ever, um, we, we did a couple of rounds of this and it started snowing and the, we just had, you know, hundreds of these moldy bins and we were outside in the freezing cold and the snow, we had this hose, we were trying to hose out these bins and the water would freeze midair. And we were like shivering, trying to scrub these moldy bins. And like, you know, if you, yeah, you will grow mold if you're a mushroom farmer and 
it's just part of it. Um, another thing that we grew was this other type of mushroom that we weren't expecting. This is an Acerea species, also a, a quote unquote cordyceps or an antipopathogenic fungi. And it started growing and we're like, that is definitely not cordyceps militaris. Um, but we noticed something interesting that, uh, we had like, you know, a few flies and fungus gnats, which any mushroom farmer or uh, gardener will, will know, um, you have fungus gnats. And they all avoided the bins that were growing this mushroom. Um, and I was like, why is that? And when we were harvesting, we noticed that we found some mummified fungus gnats and flies like around the bins. And we're like, whoa, this is actually attacking the fungus gnats. This would be huge. And looked it up. And this is actually a species that they use commercially. You can buy it off Amazon. Um, Asaria, I think it's Farinosa, if not another Asaria, but it's an Asaria species. And so this is like, great. We have our own insect biocontrol. Um, so this was, this is awesome. And, um, you know, the whole use of, of insect control is huge. Um, there's this researcher, Brian Lovett, who is incredible. He's like the cordyceps or entomopathogenic pathogenic guy in the world, um, specifically on, you know, using fungi to control pests. And he was work, working in Burkina Faso uh, on this project to uh, kill malaria carrying mosquitoes. Um, and genetically engineering it with uh, a toxin from this spider. Um, pretty nuts. Uh, and he's an amazing guy, like amazing human, super level-headed and um, big heart. He has an awesome book uh, as well. And uh, But the, the possibilities are endless. You know, I did... In early 2018, I went to Jamaica to do a farmer to farmer grant to help yeah, some poor farmers, you know, learn to grow mushrooms and to make a livelihood. And that was super exciting. Um, and like, I came from, you know, my perspective of the environment that I was growing mushrooms in and termites were just not something that I was accustomed to. And so you know, I, I think a few years before I came, there was another mushroom farmer who taught this log workshop and they showed me and the logs, or actually this was like a year or six months before. And I was like, oh, these look like they're like seven years old or something. And they're like, no, these were like six months ago, but termites just demolished them. And so they had this technique of, you know, putting it on stilts and, and things like that. But, you know, we can use fungi to control pests. Um, and and yeah, I, I did bring cordyceps militaris to Iceland. I had a really funny experience in customs on my way back. And they probably, you know, the swabs that they, they swab your hands and your bag and stuff. They went through like 30 of those. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's a mushroom. And that does not help at all. And they're like giving me the stink eye, like, what the hell are you bringing? And, um, I, I like showed them my business card and all this stuff. And they're like, you know, none of these swabs are coming off, uh, coming out, you know, to, like, I guess you can go, but I, they probably put me on a list um, somewhere because they were, they were giving me the look as I was walking away, like we are going to watch you, but I'll give you kind of the, the qu super quick rundown of how to cultivate cordyceps in jars. Uh, on a large scale. And this was, we had these tin foil containers just to carry them and fill them with rice. You can use brown rice, uh, white rice, oats, uh, wheat, a bunch of different substrates. And uh, after that, we had this nutrient broth. And uh, this is an automatic liquid filling machine that you just fill up these jars pretty easy. This is Lyra, my partner, and she's mixing that nutrient broth. Um, and these are the liquid filling machines. Uh, and then once they're filled up, we, we put on the caps, they have polyfill, which is like pillow stuffing, um, stuffed in a hole. And that's for air, air exchange. You, uh, close them tight. And this was a, an autoclave cart. So we each run in the autoclave was like 15, 
5,100 jars and we load them in the autoclave, which is that big oven, bring them out in the other side. This was like the clean section. So or all Tyvek suits. And we set up a little lab in the corner uh, and then took the liquid culture, which is the mycelium or the roots of the mushroom growing in sugar water and injected it into the substrate. And this was, uh, we had to rent a U-Haul and uh, bring it seven, seven minutes down the road. But um, this was all 5,100 jars uh, loaded up. They sat in incubation for a couple weeks. And then this is the cordyceps all grown up. And so you can see this orange color. You can see, um, you know, uh, the mushroom starting to grow. And we use cannabis lights. So they're red, blue, and white LED lights. LED because helps um, use less electricity, which is great. And uh, there's research in China that show the red, blue, and white spectrums of light help the main medicinal compounds, cordycepin, adenosine, um, adenine, things like that in the cordyceps. So we wanted to, to use that research uh, in our growing. And you could see these rubber bands around our carts uh, because they would fall all the time. We got so used to the sound of shattering glass that we'd have people visit our farm and you know, a, a jar would just fall and break and they would freak out and we wouldn't even, we wouldn't even flinch. It was just like second nature to us. But um, so that's why you know, we wanted to get back to the bins. Um, we, ch we chose to go back to jars because we're having contamination issues with the bins, but we knew that was the future. Um, so this is them growing up. And once they start getting this little Cheeto dust on them, uh, we wait a couple weeks and then they're ready to harvest. Uh, <laughs> we used narrow mouth jars and we're idiots because they were like half the price of wide mouth jars. <clears throat> and at our peak, we had like 15,000 jars in our uh, farm. And so half the price, that's pretty significant. And we went through the whole growing cycle until harvest, and we tried to stick our hand in to, to pick it out, and we couldn't fit our hand in the jar. And we're like, oh, shit, we fucked up. <laughs> we have like 15,000 jars to harvest, and we can't even like stick our hand in there. And so we had to buy – so we started using a knife. We started using this metal knife, and we'd stick it in there, and then it would crack the glass. And so we bought this like – kitty knife set for like three-year-olds <laughs> and uh, they're made out of this plastic and they're all of these colors and they would cut it and they were food safe and um, they wouldn't crack the glass and so we had to cut the the cakes in half and then like shake them out one by one it was crazy but we made it happen <clears throat> and so then we developed something called the dumpling method and we you know, this whole method is we made it free on YouTube. We're not charging any consultation or, you know, we're not selling this method or anything. Like if you want to learn how to grow, this is totally like on a, on a, a large scale. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there, like the, the Facebook group. Um, I think it's like Cordyceps Cultivation Group or something. Um, that's a great resource for beginners. Uh, William Padilla Brown has a couple of good books uh, for beginners who are just learning, you know, to grow for your first time. Um, and those are awesome resources. And this was Ryan Paul Gates also has like a similar method. Um, and this was one more for like a commercial farm. Um, I haven't seen anyone do it yet. We, we released this earlier in the year. So hopefully we get more commercial farms. That's why we re released the video. We didn't want to I'm all about free information, so um, I don't want to keep this secret. I want more, as many cordyceps farmers out there as possible. I want people to do exactly the same thing we do and, and full transparency about what we're doing. Um, so our full substrate, our whole technique, it's all on there. Um, but I'll give you kind of a, a quick overview of that video. So why cordyceps? Someone because my... Uh, it first started because of my Lyme disease and was looking for something sustainable for my energy. Um, I was totally just zapped of energy and, you know, I could drink coffee and it just was such a short term thing that would just 
zap my adrenals in the long term. And this was something that really helped. And a lot of, uh, you know, Stephen Buhner is one of the, the lead herbalists on Lyme disease out there. And he recommends cordyceps and like all of his protocols. So I was reading his books and um, just happened to be in the same space uh, to where I was like, Oh yeah, cordyceps. Um, right. As I was getting diagnosed and feeling a lot of symptoms. And so, you know, and the, the beginning I showed that like small grow, I, I only did it for myself and, you know, just for my symptoms. And I saw such great benefit that I just wanted to share it with the world. And I saw that here in the U S it was just, you know, there's, there's lion's mane farmers and reishi farmers and shiitake farmers, but nobody growing cordyceps, actual mushrooms, um, on a large scale. And, you know, there's, a, there was a few people growing on, on a small scale, including myself, but, you know, not enough to actually like give to a lot of people. Um, and so wanted to develop these techniques and then just hand it, hand the torch over for free and just have other people run with it. Uh, so we can get this medicine to as many people because, Places like China have been, they, they grow millions and millions and millions of dried pounds and, um, or kilos. And so the price is super cheap. It's super accessible to people. And, you know, the, the cordyceps are expensive. And I also want it to be accessible to people of, you know, lower, lower income. Um, and it, they're still pretty expensive. Like it's still a supplement and, one day, hopefully, we'll get the technology and the infrastructure in here in the U.S. to just grow a ton more. Um, and so, part of the reason that I wanted to have it fully transparent was to have people, more and more people, like develop new techniques and just uh, make it better. Because um, we can only take it so far, and I'm, I'm only so smart. I'm uh, there's way smarter people in the world that that'll take this to the next yeah. level. So I, um, I want, yeah. Oh, and kind of along that line, uh, are there any like medical studies into the cordyceps and Lyme disease treatment? Like, you know, as far as like, I don't know. Yeah. Clinical trials as, as opposed to like precursory research. Yeah. I would look on ResearchGate. Um, I haven't seen any human trials. Lyme disease is something that's really not understood. Um, and I think, I feel like we do not have a full grasp on what exactly it is, what's happening. Um, people have, you know, um, people get affected by it way differently, person to person. So one person, you know, uh, could have very mild symptoms. Some people have to be put on an IV of antibiotics for like years. Uh, and I had it pretty bad, but not as bad as some people I knew. And so, um, yeah, no, no papers come to mind, but I would, I would look on ResearchGate and SciHub and, um, and, and look, but nothing comes to mind. Um, so this is my partner, Lyra, and she, uh, also is working at Mushroom Revival and, um, we have a love for orange mushrooms. This was actually our first date. We went mushroom hunting and found this crazy chicken of the woods uh patch and um so i'm actually gonna breeze through this really quickly because just look on youtube uh just mushroom revival it's one of our first videos or latest videos and you can watch the whole thing if you want to learn how to grow um but tons of different substrates this is the one that we used um add some nutrients mix it all up with water we use this silicone kneading bag uh, to, to make bread. Um, and this was like transformational for a process cause we could use it over and over again. Um, sterilize it, take it out in our lab, break it up. Like we're kneading dough, dump the spawn or the seed into this bag, massage it again. And then we would take our bin. So we love this Sterlite gasket bin it usually comes with this foam gasket and we took that out and we put food grade silicone. Um, so it's actually airtight. Um, here we drilled some holes and we have Tegaderm, which is like, you know, for air exchange, they use in the medical industry. This is what it looks like. Really awesome. I actually never heard of this, but 
I like it way better than micro pore tape or, um, or pillow stuffing. This is awesome. And we tried all these different methods, um, as you can see, but we liked the big Sterlite bin the best. And so once we had our bins, we would clean it out with parasitic acid, isopropyl alcohol, and then we built this like um, UV chamber and it would blast UV light, unraveling the DNA of any contaminants we didn't want. And then we would dump that you know, rice with the nutrients, with the, the mycelium in the bin, spread it all out and uh, snap it closed. It looks like these are, you could stick your finger through these, but this has the tegaderm, it's just see-through. Um, and incubate in the dark, move to fruiting with this crazy colored light. And seven to eight weeks later, we have cordyceps mushrooms. And so we could either dehydrate it, um, or we'd always dehydrate it, but either dehydrate it for people to use for teas, and they would come in all shapes and sizes, or we'd make a tincture, you know, as alcohol, hot water extraction, and make all these blends. So this, these were like our second iteration, and we got certified organic. We were the first uh, Cordyceps Militaris mushroom farm in the United States, actually the Americas, um, to be certified organic. Uh, for cordyceps. So that was cool. I, I don't know about today. I hope there's more farms that are certified organic that are growing cordyceps. I haven't checked in a while. Um, so I don't know if that stat is still true. But we also made, um, this is compostable packaging um, and a label. So that was something like really fundamental uh, going back to like the earlier mission of making the world a better place of if we're supplying medicine, we also want it to be eco-friendly. Um, these are some farms in China, just to get a perspective. And they actually, this substrate is in the middle and it'll grow up and down. So they're kind of playing with gravity there. And it's really in this innovative process of this double bin method, which is awesome to see. Uh, they'll use jars and they'll turn it on the side. Um, they'll use these round kind of plastic containers, uh, and they'll even stack them up. And you can see, like, this is a really shitty picture, but it goes as far as the eye can see. And you can see these, like, millions and millions of dried pounds of cordyceps uh, and many different species other than cordyceps militaris. So we're, like, way far. Even though we were the first people in the world, the U.S., to grow Cordyceps militaris, which is crazy. Uh, we just kind of had a hiatus. And then now I guess we're trying to catch back up. Um, but let me go through some species of functional mushrooms that people should know and are, are kind of gaining some popularity in the US. So we got Cordyceps militaris, got reishi. Um, this is the Tibetan Cordyceps, Ophiocordyceps senescence, which grows out of a caterpillar head. And it's like a cousin of the Cordyceps militaris. Has a lot of the same compounds: cordycepin, adenosine, adenine, uh, things like that. We have lion's mane, which one of my favorite mushrooms. And I, I heard a lot of people in the chat wanting to learn about lion's mane. And usually, it's grown on uh, sawdust. And so, you know, one method is growing it in these plastic bags. I've seen people grow it in bins, just popping out of the side seen people grow it out of like trash cans. I've seen people five gallon buckets, you know, you can get really creative on how you grow lion's mane. Another thing is jars, um, that are made out of plastic. And that's, if you look at the mushroom farm, mycopia, they have a really awesome, sustainable, reusable jar technique for growing. And I think that's the coolest method to grow lion's mane, um, and easiest to harvest. You just twist it, uh, and reuse the jars over and over again. Uh, this mushroom is, I'll go back. This mushroom is, reishi is really known for lung health and heart health, um, relaxation, uh, sleep, um, and, you know, some normal anti-inflammatory uh, activity. This is for energy. And Cordyceps militaris, the orange mushroom that I've been talking about, also great for energy as well and, and lung support. Uh, lion's mane, the brain mushroom, really great for nerve growth factor and memory, cognitive function, 
We get chaga, not technically a mushroom. It's technically a sclerotia or a canker. And it's a mass of mycelium that has just uh, grows on the side of birch trees. And awesome for supporting your immune system. Uh, your immune system, um, and really high in some anti or uh, antioxidant compounds like ergothionine and, and things like that. Um, shiitake, great gourmet mushroom, and really, you know, awesome for supporting immune health and liver function uh, and healthy blood sugar levels. To the right, you can. Uh, this is a electron microscope view of a single gill, a cross section of a gill. And this, you can actually reach out to universities and ask to, to look in their electron microscope and they'll probably say, yes, uh, this is how we got this image. We just like reached out to a, a university that had one and they were like, so unbelievably happy to give us a tour. My Taki, the dancing mushroom, uh, Graffola fundosa, one of the, my favorite gourmet mushrooms to eat, is so yummy, and it, it typically grows in the fall. And this uh, typically under hardwood trees like oak, and this is like such a freaking good mushroom to eat, uh, and also helps you know support the immune system, healthy blood sugar levels, and uh, and it, pretty much all. Functional mushrooms are adaptogens, so helping our body adapt to normal levels of stress and fatigue. So, especially 2020, it's a weird year. Uh, you know, we, we, I for one can use more adaptogens. So, uh, more functional mushrooms in your diet is is key. We get turkey tail, and n notably, the the most famous compounds in turkey tail are PSP and PSK. I actually can't really talk more about this because FDA uh, regulations, but Google it and you'll find out yourself about PSP and PSK from Turkey Tail and the wonders of those two compounds. This is the mushroom on the cover of my book by Martin Bridge, the awesome visionary artist that I was talking about before. We get Wolfaporia extensa or Poria cocos. This is another sclerotia, not technically a mushroom. Um, and awesome mushroom for, um, uh, uh, how do I say, sorry, I'm trying to, I have to comply with Deshea compliance, which is like FDA wording. So I can't, I have to be creative on how I list the benefits of mushrooms. <laughs> uh, re really good for happiness, supporting, um, uh, mental well-being, uh, let's put it that way, and uh, also uh, fluid retention and um, supporting the immune system. We get Mishima. Uh, there's a ton of different uh, medicinal Felinus species. Felinus lintius is probably the most famous, and it means women's island in Japanese and really notable for supporting women's health and immune function. We get tremella, and this is one of my favorite mushrooms. It's really gooey and and like uh, uh, really awesome for a lot of people use it for skincare and skin health. Um, it actually is more water has better water retention than hydrolauric acid, and so a lot of people use it in their skincare lines and um, for. Uh, holding on to water in the body um, and also has uh, helps support brain health and cognitive function, memory, things like that. We get Agaricus blazii. This has a bunch of different names, but awesome mushroom. We got split gill, schizophilum commune. This is eaten as a gourmet mushroom in many different countries. And it, it, it was a cousin of the one that was found underneath the ocean. Um, we get oyster mushrooms. This is like the most typical celebrity mushroom uh, other than the button mushroom. Artist conch, Ganoderma, another Ganoderma species is like a cousin of, of reishi. You can actually carve different, uh, different carvings on the bottom of this mushroom, which uh, gives it its name. 
we get enokitake and this is awesome in soups and stir fries it's one of my favorite mushrooms as well as a gourmet mushroom to throw in soups and if you haven't heard mushrooms are freaking hot right now and we're part of the shroom boom here in the united states uh we're just really far behind in compared to a lot of different countries but we are pretty far ahead um or uh more advanced than a "Quote unquote advanced um, in the in the mycological field than than a lot of different countries, but we're expected to hit fifty billion dollars uh, in the next few years." Forbes says mushrooms are so hot right now. Whole Foods, you know, claimed it was the top food trend of two thousand eighteen. It was just also rated as one of the top trends in twenty twenty. And celebrities such as Kim Kardashian, Gwyneth Paltrow, and a ton of different celebrities left and right are claiming to use functional mushrooms on a daily basis. It sits in the supplement. Functional mushrooms sit in the supplement market, which sits in the functional food and beverage. Uh, year by year, sales show certain functional mushrooms increasing up to 811%. Uh, with COVID right now and just our emphasis on health, we're seeing mushroom companies, functional mushroom companies popping up left and right. Um, and it's, it's yeah, uh, a little concerning as we saw with the CBD company because with more and more companies coming in, it dilutes the credibility and uh, kind of the uh, efficacy. There's a lot of just, you know, a lot of gibberish out there and a lot of... Uh, wacky stuff floating around so it's not always good that it is growing um the the best that it is um most people don't know for functional mushrooms most of the time this is not a hard rule but most of the time you will want the actual mushroom and i'll get more into that in a second but most companies and this is just a u.s thing i don't know why just the u.s thing I haven't come across any other country that has this problem, but um, there's a lot of manufacturers that grow mycelium, which is the roots of the mushroom, on grain, such as rice or oats or you know wheat berries or things like that. They'll blend it up into a powder, and they'll sell it as a powder. They'll throw it into a capsule, things like that. Not bad. It's just when it's labeled as a mushroom. Um, that's when I have a problem with it and it's just false labeling, false advertising. Um, and most people just don't know about mushrooms or fungi. They don't know the terminology. So, you know, and some companies just don't know any better. They uh, have another product, they want to throw mushrooms into it and they source from a company and they... They, they don't know the difference between mycelium on grain and mushrooms. And so they'll label their product mushrooms, and it's actually against the FDA to do so, uh, which we'll get into in a second. Um, and so you get mushrooms, typical mushroom basidomycota life cycle. Spores come out, they grow into mycelium, and from mycelium, you get mushroom fruiting bodies. This is what mycelium on grain looks like growing in a bag. Most mushroom farmers will use this as spawn uh, or seeds, so to speak, to grow more mushrooms. Um, and most companies here in the U.S. say that, you know, I can't separate the mycelium from the substrate it's growing on. Uh, but, you know, we've been... <laughs> the first actual bioreactor ever made was made in the U.S. for penicillin uh, and for growing fungi uh, on a mass scale. So this technology has been around for over 100 years, and it's similar to brewing beer, and you just grow the mycelium in this liquid broth, and you can strain out pure mycelium. Um, and so you're not getting any fillers or, or any starchy materials that you would if it's growing like this. Um, you do need the, the infrastructure to grow it, uh, so I think that cost is prohibitive for some people. Uh, so they'll say, you know, I can't separate it. Um, but since 1976, the FDA has this rule um, stating that, you know, you, you, uh, companies cannot label 
their product as a mushroom if it's actually mycelium. Uh, this is not something new. It's been around since 1976 and, um, and reissued in 1980, 1988. Uh, so it's been around for, for a long time. But we see a lot of these new companies, whether they know better or not, get really tricky uh, in their marketing. And this is just unfortunate uh, for the whole mycology community of labeling, you know, organic mushroom powder or two grams of organic mushroom superfood per serving or mycelial biomass and fruit body, which most of the time is not true. Or putting other ingredients, dried mycelial brown rice powder. Um, so uh, honestly, it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Uh, it's going to be a class action lawsuit um, is my, uh, that's my thinking. And I'm, I hope that it changes. I'm, I don't want anyone to get sued. And um, it's just kind of unfortunate that this is happening. And so some people that are getting into the mushroom scene are, are just getting the wrong information. Um, especially of what they're putting in their body and spending a lot of money on. Uh, and so this full spectrum um, is what a lot of people say. And it's, you know, it sounds really awesome. This mycelium, you get the enzymes, you get the primordia, you get the spores, you get the mushroom fruiting bodies, you get it all. So that it must be better, like, you know, with hemp or cannabis. But it's just another buzzword and um, it, it, you're, you're getting like 90% grain. And there's a lot of studies out there that have tested a lot of these products and it, they're 90% grain. Um, and so a lot of those compounds of interest are just getting severely diluted. I've toured a lot of these companies and it, this is what they're calling uh, and fruiting bodies. They just look like this and they're like little dots. Um, you have to look with like a magnifying glass to see them. And they're primordia, which are like hyphal knots. And they're just bunches of mycelium. Uh, and they're almost microscopic. They're really tiny. Um, these companies are calling them mushrooms, uh, which is just, it's, it's the wrong uh, terminology. So, um, and then the other thing is a lot of companies don't extract. And if you know anything about mushrooms, they're made out of chitin. And chitin is the same material as shrimp shells, lobster shells. So it's one of the hardiest materials on planet Earth. And, you know, making it into a powder helps, but, you know, your body is going to work so hard to try to extract those compounds. Um, you won't get the full benefit. And so a lot of people will, you know, freeze dry it or, um, just dehydrate it and then hammer mill it. Um, and this is what a hammer mill looks like into a powder. There's a great study by Bastyr University. This was on kind of like anti-tumor properties of just unextracted powder versus just hot water extraction. And they found uh, the solid line is um, pretty much anti-tumor uh, uh, activity of hot water extracts and it you could see it's night and day um, and this was this is not even including uh, alcohol extracting so there's a whole class of compounds that are alcohol soluble and a whole class of compounds that are water soluble um, and other solvents as well but uh, I'll just use water and alcohol as, as kind of the main two solvents that are used so this is what you know, for example, cordyceps mycelium, cordyceps militaris mycelium on grain looks like, and then this is what, you know, actual mushrooms look like. Uh, and so we did some tests with Bastyr University. We just pulled two products off the shelf that were mycelium on grain. This is just pure rice powder. This is our cordyceps, blended it, same amounts in water. You can take iodine powder and the iodine will react to starch and make the water a deep purple. So this is our cordyceps. So this is two generic brand names that you see off the shelf. And this is what happens. Um, it's not really crazy. It's not rocket science. Obviously, they're putting in the label that they have grain in there. But uh, it's actually darker than pure rice, <laughs> which is surprising. And 
it should look this bright orange, but it doesn't. And another kind of misconception in the industry is uh, polysaccharides. So polysaccharides are long sugar chains, and they don't really mean anything. Uh, there are some medicinal polysaccharides, like 1316 beta glucans, are technically polysaccharides, but sugar, like any, you know, rice has a bunch of polysaccharides. Um, they're not all medicinal. And so to, to say we have this much polysaccharides doesn't really mean anything. Um, there are also different types of beta glucans. So, you know, a lot of companies started saying, you know, you should test for beta glucans. That is the analysis. That's kind of the benchmark to test the, uh, the potency of a product. And so some, some companies say, well, we have tons of beta glucans and you know, what people don't know is there, there's two different, or there's many different types of beta glucans, but two that we're going to focus on one, three, one, six and one, three, one, four, you know, uh, it's probably gibberish for most people, but one, three, one, six is what you want. It's fungal based immunomodulating, uh, over 6,000 public publications investigating the immunomodulating effects of 1316 beta glucans. 1314, you know, uh, have an effect on cholesterol levels. And, you know, as you can see, like whole grain uh, cereal and things like that are toting their 1314 beta glucans, which are great. They're great for you, <clears throat> but don't have an effect on the immune system. Um, and a lot of times they're in such low amounts that you're better off just eating oatmeal every day. Uh, it, and it'll be a lot cheaper for you if you want those, you know, uh, cholesterol, um, type benefits. So, you know, time and time again, it, all these different species have been tested. Uh, you can see the fruiting bodies or the actual mushrooms have significantly more one, three, one, six beta glucans in terms of starch and the mycelium has really high starch and negligible uh, immunomodulating compounds, or at least the 1316 compounds. We tested cordyceps. We found <clears throat> that uh, our cordyceps that were growing, um, the fruiting bodies were up to 400 times more 1316 beta glucans than other uh, mycelium on grain. Um, that are out there. And that, that's huge, but it's not the only compound in functional mushrooms. So, uh, but it is a good benchmark to test and, and have as, as minimal uh, kind of factors as possible. Um, we did some, some research with Reishi Strauss. She spearheaded these, this project at Bastyr University for the last couple of years, testing coriocepin and denosine with, with uh, cordyceps fruiting bodies and mycelium on grain and different, you know, best extraction methods. If you, if you make your own cordyceps medicine, maybe screenshot this. Um, I won't go through it, but basically we found, or Reishi found and her team that fruiting bodies have up to 51.52 times more cordycepin and over seven times more adenosine, the two kind of uh, celebrity compounds that you're looking for in cordyceps as compared to mycelium or mycelium on grain. And um, yeah, if, if you're looking to make your own tincture or tea, these are the best times that we found. Um, and amino acids, uh, a ton more, up to 13 times more amino acids. Hey, Alex, can I interrupt you real quick? Go because uh, you said to screenshot that, but your, your, the video was covering up the part of the recipe. So I'm going to move the little video out of the way and and people can actually read the whole thing. Okay. You can start again, sorry. Give me a second to drink water, so thanks. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> You've been going, it's been great. So me, really no, I'll say, I'm, and I'm gonna go speed fire because I noticed that I'm already way over time and um, y'all end at nine, uh, so I got 13 minutes to speed through the rest of this, but... Um, Amino acids, uh, triterpenes, way more, uh, almost uh, like uh, mycelium of reishi were tested for triterpenes and none were even found. 
So triterpenes are huge for anti-inflammatory abilities. We're, we're going to do some studies pretty soon on uh, terpenes, you know, uh, pretty, pretty notable in the hemp or, or cannabis uh, scene and, and uh, how to best extract them and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny that most reishi, there's a study done, most reishi out there is not even reishi. <clears throat> and you could read this paper, it's really interesting, but we're just getting a lot of, you know, things are not what they seem to be and are not labeled as what they are. And so it's up to us as, you know, uh, industry leaders and consumers to really do our due diligence to make it really transparent and, uh, and have, you know, ethical standards for this. And that comes into analytical fingerprints and making our, our testing really transparent um, and just having all of our test results so anyone can see the two compounds that I'm going to talk about that are actually higher in the mycelium than the fruiting bodies are GABA and lovastatin, uh, and specifically in, in reishi. Um, however, they're in such a low amount that, that you're not... The recommended amount is 100 to 300 milligrams of GABA a day to help with stress and anxiety. You're only getting, you know, 113 milligrams per kilo. So you need a, a thousand grams of of ganoderma lucida mycelium, pure mycelium, uh, not not even the 90 percent grain uh, stuff. So it, it's just not practical. And then lovastatin is a uh, cholesterol drug. And it's it's a compound, um, notably in in a lot of different mushrooms, but obviously a lot higher in mycelium. Um, but you need to take, you know, you need like twenty to eighty milligrams a day. That's twenty two to eighty eight grams of this mushroom mycelium. That gets pretty expensive. Thirty days worth of lovastat in the drug is just seven dollars and twenty four cents. Um, so it's not really cost effective. Um, there's other compounds like in uh, lion's mane, which I don't have. And this is needs a ton more research on it because there are certain compounds in the mycelium that are not in the fruiting bodies. There are certain compounds in the fruiting bodies that are not in the mycelium. But we're just, you know, we're just scratching the surface of uh analyzing what those compounds do. And so we're actually doing a study in Malaysia right now um, with some hippocampal cell lines uh, with, with mice and seeing you know, anti-inflammatory effects and um, nerve growth factor of you know, mycelium versus fruiting bodies versus different extraction methods. And that's something that, you know, um, Again, there's so many different compounds and, and we're just scratching the surface. And I don't want anyone to, to think that we're done. We figured it out. You know, we don't know anything. And, uh, and we're just scratching the surface of, of all the compounds that, are, that make the whole entourage effect of, of uh, these mushrooms and, and mycelium. But huge, you know, for chicken feed. Um, I had chickens for a while and and would feed my cordyceps mycelium to the chickens, uh, increase egg weight, egg yolk weight, egg protein, um, it lowers the cholesterol level, helps the sweetness of the yolk. These are some of my chickens from a while ago. And um, they helped them a lot, I noticed. We made tempeh for a while, so like a, a new food source, and uh, we stopped doing it. But there's a ton of companies making new fungal proteins, which is awesome. Uh, and materials, you can make materials out of mycelium and compost it for, for soil. Um, and we've gone through a lot of different iterations as a business. This was our, our first logo ever that I, I whipped up in Canva in like 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, this is what we started with in early 2018. And we evolved... You know, these, this was our product line. We had some tinctures. We actually started with some labels that I, I printed out in my home. Actually, my, my roommate's printer, because I didn't even own a printer. 
and they weren't waterproof the labels so you would like they would drain uh, or i mean they would smear um when the alcohol would land on them and they're just like really funny um to look back and we upgraded to these shiny waterproof labels um and we made capsules for a little bit they were a pain in the butt they <clears throat> we did them all by hand one capsule by one capsule insane we got these little like capsule machines and it was just so much work to do it um so we we discontinued them but they're they're fun early 2019 we launched with a new logo and new look and had a new line of products and this is when we got certified organic uh about like almost two years ago now and so we had a bunch of different blends with herbs and mushrooms and had a whole tincture series and powder and cordyceps uh dried mushrooms for tea and now i'm going to give y'all the 2020 version of mushroom revival that we're evolving into so this is our new logo and we're actually launching next week with all this new goodies and so we have four new products we got our energy, calm, focus, daily 10. And I, I've only showed just a small group of people this. So y'all are getting a sneak peek before it goes live. And so we got the cordyceps, the reishi, lion's mane, and a mix of 10 mushrooms. A uh, whole new website. <clears throat> and more on the transparency that I was talking about before. Uh, we'll have a QR code on the side with all of our lab results. Um, we we kind of want to make it standard in the industry to be fully transparent and uh, see what is actually in your product and um, be able to see yourself and, and get a little more heady. So DNA, heavy metals, biological contaminants, 1316 beta glucans, triterpenes, all the different ganaderic acids, um, you know, uh, cordycepin, adenosine, um, you know, all these different things, trying to be no bullshit. And so we can bust the myth that mycelium is better than fruiting bodies. Mostly, uh, you know, there's like more uh, norbeosistent or more, um, oh, what's that compound? I'm drawing a blank. There's, there's a, you know, obviously there's exceptions with like GABA and lovastatin and er, or arinacines and um, the specific compound in, uh, in um, psilocybin and a psilocybin species that's more in the hyphal tips than the fruiting body. But most of the time you're better off with, with the fruiting body, but it's not absolute. Um, full spectrum, kind of a myth. You can't separate mycelium from grain. It's a myth. Uh, you can grow it in a bioreactor. Polysaccharides, not really a compound that you should be worrying about or a class of compounds. You should be really concerned with the uh, more specific compounds. There's something that we get all the time. People think you need a gram of mushrooms a day. <laughs> I don't know where that started. And I don't know who started it or what, but like most people, we get emails all the time and messages like, I need a gram um, a day. And that's like a dose. Uh, it's, it doesn't exist. All the clinical studies range from milligrams to all the way up to like nine grams multiple times a day. It ranges all over the place. So one gram a day is super irrelevant. And one gram of like mycelium on grain is way different than fruiting bodies is way different than, you know, uh, dual extracted versus, you know, just powder. Um, so it's kind of irrelevant and I would just chuck that out the window. I, I put this image in there and, um, because I noticed that there's a lot of, you know, there's this racism in the mushroom community about China. Um, and, I don't know wh what it is, but it just, you know, it's like uh, most people think like mushrooms from China, it's like dirty or like toxic or they'll like cut corners. And it's like, it's really unfortunate because 
most of the the science is in China, and most of the like over eighty percent of mushrooms grown in the world are grown in China, and they're light years ahead of where we are in the United States or other countries in the world, and it's just really unfortunate to have that that sort of um, that prejudice and racism, you know, in such a awesome community. Um, so where it's like, you know, we got a lot to learn. Uh, and I've, I've been to China a few times and it's like, it's nuts. The amount of infrastructure there for mushrooms and the culture and like the history and the science, it's unbelievable. Uh, and so throw that out the window. Um, I, I've toured mushroom farms in China and they are like, and I've toured a, a ton of mushroom farms and facilities here in the U S and like it, it you know, there are shitty mushroom farms everywhere and like shitty facilities and shitty practices everywhere in the world. Um, but, you know, I, I think the infrastructure and the science and everything on a whole scale in China is way beyond what we have in the U.S. Uh, future of medicinal mushrooms, psilocybin. Um, I'm seeing hundreds of different startups with magic mushrooms pop up left and right cashed in from the cannabis industry and are trying to make a quick buck. It's, it's a little scary. Um, but I think it's going to be huge. Um, I saw this Neuralink, uh, video the other day of Elon Musk making this new technology of capturing and recording memories. And I was like, Oh my God, everyone needs to download like a five gram trip with a Neuralink and, <laughs> and this, this should be a precursor for, you know, uh, the president or, you know, all these people, I don't know. uh, I don't know. Elon Musk was pretty like, Oh, COVID is going to go away. And then that dude caught it. So I, I don't know if I trust him that much. So who knows? Yeah. Gonna... I, it'll be <laughs> a while to put and... stuff in my brain. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it'll be a while. And then, you know, let's keep it organic and just pop, pop the real mushrooms. But right. I, I think this, you know, I, I thought it was funny to download a five gram trip, uh, but we're going to see huge industrial scale uh, here in the U S with fully automated farms um, for psilocybin and all different mushrooms. And a lot of people are scared of this, of, you know, 5g and AI and, you know, um, robots and things, but it's going to happen. And it's, you know, I, I think it can be beneficial just like any technology if we use it the right way. And um, it can be detrimental, uh, but we'll see. The, this is happening in China and it's, it's pretty revolutionary. And it can be more sustainable than um, smaller scale mushroom farms that are using single use plastic because they're using these uh, reusable um, containers that they can grow you know, over and over again. Um, so, uh, you know, sustainability with scale and, and there's a, a super, super fine line with that um, and how to do it. Um, this is the, one of the biggest mushroom companies in the world. This is like one of their many different campuses, uh, but it's unbelievable. This was one just Cordyceps. So they have like a Cordyceps University, a Cordyceps Cafe, a Cordyceps gift shop, a Cordyceps museum, a cordyceps, like everything, uh, is unbelievable. I got to visit and this is like a model of their, one of their cordyceps, uh, grow rooms. Um, but yeah, unbelievable. It, it's crazy. Um, we're going to see mushrooms pop up. Like this is small hold. They're doing awesome things, you know, on, on the other side, we're going to see it on smaller scales, just pop up in restaurants and, and in grocery store. Um, and we're going to see a lot of more integral practices. Um, and these are the, the five good practices, good laboratory, agriculture, manufacturing, production, and clinical practices uh, as kind of our, our bench scale to how we proceed uh, without going all over the place and having unethical uh, practices. So more drugs are going to be developed. We're going to see new extraction technologies and methods and equipment um, a lot of them are going to be on the curtails of the cannabis industry, uh, but we're going to see, you know, a lot of different extraction technologies from, from many different other industries. Uh, one 
awesome company, Novozymes. I would look them up. They're doing groundbreaking stuff, and I don't think they get enough recognition. They focus on enzymes uh, for many, many different uh, multi-billion dollar world-changing industries from uh, pharmaceuticals to bio biofuel to pulp, paper, leather making, bioremediation, um, agriculture. Unbelievable. They're super cool. Um, and enzymes are the future for not only all these industries, but for cleaning up toxic waste in our environment. We're going to see mushrooms enter in so many different cool products. I mean, this was a cordyceps soy sauce that I saw in, in China. And it's like, yeah, if you eat, if you, you know, have soy sauce every day, like throw some functional mushrooms in it, why not? And soy sauce, I, I, this product probably wouldn't sell very well here in the U S but we're seeing like mushroom coffee and, and all these different cool, innovative ways to weave in healing mushrooms into everyday use so people aren't so afraid of fungi and it's just it's just integrated in their daily habits which is super cool um and we're going to see a, a ton more species being cultivated used as medicine uh weaved into products this is cordyceps cicadae that i was talking about before one of the first mushrooms to be recorded in uh written uh, literature in china and there's a study, 25% of China has consumed cordyceps cicadae. It grows out of cicada, obviously, and it's been used for medicine over 2,000 years. I've never heard of this until last fall, and it's, it's one of the most cultivated mushrooms in the world and one that's used for medicine um, for the longest. And it's unbelievable uh, that uh, we've never heard of this, or I have never. Um, you know, and, and they're doing all these crazy clinical trials. And what's, what's nuts is that it was listed in new dietary ingredients in dietary supplements in 1998 by the FDA. So you can throw it in, you know, dietary supplements here in the U.S. And it's, it's, it's regulated as a new dietary ingredient. Um, so I don't know why it's not, but it's a really cool mushroom. Um, and you know, this is an example of, of a product uh, in the Cordyceps Museum, and they, they even sell the, the cicadas just like in this mummified mycelium. Um, I almost bought this. You can't really tell, but these bins are, these tubs are huge. And like, this was the day before I was going to the airport to fly home. And I was like, oh, I can't, I can't smuggle this through customs. Uh, there's no way. And so I left it there um, and I was so sleep deprived from like the time change that I didn't think of it. They had these little baggies in here that I could have stuck in a sock and then cultured it when I got home and uh, it would have been easy. But uh, one day, and I, and I hope, I, I hope this is a, a inspiration for someone to start growing this. And I, I think it would be huge here in the U.S. to grow all these different types of species Um Another different entomopathogenic fungi that also grows on a cicada is the Cereus sinclarii. And it's, it's been used, a compound, uh, myuricin, might be butchering that, for multiple sclerosis. And it, it was sold, it, the revenues from this drug was $2.5 billion just in 2017 alone from this weird fungus that grows off a of cicada. And so I feel like the, the potential for these new niche species, especially the weird entomopathogenic fungi, we're just scratching the surface. Um, this is Yushui Tan, which is kind of one of my role models. Uh, he grew 91 different species of, of cordyceps. And this is unbelievable. Like, you know, at, at, we're standing in, in front of the Chinese uh, Cordyceum or the Cordy Cordyceps Museum. And if anyone goes, this is in, um, this is right outside Shanghai. And so pretty easy to get to and so worth the trip if you're ever in China and you're around Shanghai. It's such an incredible experience. But we're going to see a lot more museums open up in the United States. And I would love to open a, a and a cordyceps museum here in the U.S. or some mushroom museum, I think, is huge for developing that culture. 
Um, and we're starting to see it in our, uh, our legislature. This is Juliana Furchi, and she is from Chile. Uh, she has a company, uh, Fungi Foundation. Uh, they just launched Global, and they're actually raising funds right now. So if you want to donate, I would, I would go. And um, she w made it so Chile was the first country to put fungi on the red list of endangered species. And we're starting to see fungi being, you know, honored in law and legislature, which is huge. And um, so, you know, and more, you know, women mycology, uh, mycologists coming up and doing incredible things. You know, Juliana is one of the, the most kick-ass mycologists in the world. She's incredible. Um, more universities. This is part of uh, that company I was talking about that I totally drawing a blank on, they have a whole university from preschool to PhD, all about mushrooms. And this was something like he was explaining, somebody asked like, why do you have this? And he said, well, we want to hire the best people. And so we start them in preschool. <laughs> and, you know, I would love to go to preschool all through PhD for mushrooms, but, you know, we just don't have it. We have a few universities that have mycology programs and and you can get your degree but but not a lot um i went to hampshire college and i got to create my own major so i majored in a made-up uh mycology and the focus a hyper focus on microremediation but like you know the university was no help for me um but to have like institutions that you know how teach fungi is huge and it doesn't have to be brick and mortar it can be online as well we're starting to see online classes like this one or online universities start popping up which is awesome um, and younger people as well uh, you know we uh, we had him on our our podcast he's uh, he's awesome um, he's seven years old um, Talerio Watkins and he has a uh, tiger mushroom farms and I would look him up on YouTube. He's awesome. Um, or our podcast episode. He's one of the most inspiring kids on the planet. Just seven years old, has his own company, his own mushroom farm. Um, super inspiring, wants to run for president, wants to become a, a zillionaire. <laughs> but um, it's great. And so we're seeing a lot more younger kids come out, a lot more awesome books like Entangled Life. Um, as someone said, they were reading by Merlin Sheldrick, one of the most humble individuals on planet Earth, just so knowledgeable and no ego whatsoever, which we need more people like Merlin, just zero ego, all about the science, all about pushing mycology further and um, not in it for the fame or, or any of that, just in it for the fungi. Uh, and we're seeing new movies like Fantastic Fungi, just just mushrooming the culture around mushrooms in all different ways. Uh, batteries, you know, there's, the, this is unbelievable, but, you know, with Tesla and like all these, this, this move from fossil fuels into electricity and, and more sustainable uh, sources, we're going to have a, a better need for batteries. And so this still, um, this still uses some toxic, uh, materials, the battery, the battery industry is unbelievably toxic, but fungi, uh, can be a better conductor for batteries. And, and I'm actually working with, with a company right now, uh, on more eco-friendly batteries. And I think it's going to revolutionize the world and, uh, I'm super excited for it. Um, and this is a slime mold, not technically a fungi anymore, but, uh, mapping out roadways. And so using fungi and biomimicry as a way to mimic the way nature does it to make our infrastructure more sustainable and eco-friendly and better. Um, and micro-materials. So we have so many plastics and styrofoams and, and uh, these really toxic materials in our planet. We can make it more eco-friendly. And micro-materials is just blowing up right now. Uh, shoes, bike helmets, chairs, uh, lampshades, bags. Um, I mean, this this shawl dress thing is is uh, micro silk, which is the craziest, or micro silk, which is crazy, uh, made with fungi. Um, 
And these companies are, are starting to partner with like really big companies like Adidas and, um, and like, I can't remember a lot of the, the other ones, I think Gucci and like all these crazy companies are trying to be a little, a little more sustainable, which is awesome. Um, and fungi in space, we're back to it. So we had a couple of researchers on our podcast, uh, and one of them, Eckhart Tarina Datachova, and then a couple of young kids who were like, I think 16 and 17, um, are working with NASA and um, a couple other space agencies to develop spacesuits made out of mycelium and then also uh, fungal, um, uh, what do you call it, um, barriers on spaceships to protect against the radiation in space. And what's awesome about this is you can grow it on the space station. So you can bring this little, you know, little grain spawn or whatever it is, and then you can grow your own spacesuit in space um, or your own, you know, if we're kind of uh, go to Mars, you know, we can grow our own space uh, huts or whatever and, and protect against the radiation. So this is huge. I ha I'm, I'm a little, I think we should focus on planet earth. We have enough problems down, down on this floating blue ball, but <laughs> still awesome. Still cool. And uh, Microma, a cool company. Uh, making fungal dyes to replace really toxic chemical dyes in food. So, you know, like yellow 40 or red five, or, you know, all these toxic chemicals that are petroleum based in foods, we can replace with fungal sustainable dyes, which is really awesome. We get bitter blocker, uh, one of the fastest growing biotechnology companies, uh, microtechnology, and they developed this, uh, this, uh, these metabolites from fungi that, block your bitter receptors on your tongue, uh, which is like, okay, why would you need that? Well, we have so much sugar in our foods nowadays. We're just dumping so much sugar in, in our sodas and our granola bars and all this stuff. If we can block the bitter receptors on our tongue, we'll need less sugar to add to these products. Um, and sugar acts on the brain just like cocaine does and it's um it can be super addictive and and really detrimental for health so this is huge um and then fungal proteins so you know this is ecovative working on you know fungal meat alternatives to meat which is super super cool super sustainable it grows in 14 days or less and we can get super high protein really um low fat um really healthy alternatives to the the um, animal agricultural business. So this is huge for sustainability in, on planet Earth. And it tastes almost identical, which is super cool. And then also working to make new scaffolding for faux meat or cell-based meat. So, um, uh, you know, lab-grown meat on the scaffolding of fungi uh, to replace cows and and things like that so it's it's unbelievable the the technology and the biotechnology space so we're gonna get you know a lot more food meat replacement sugar replacement dyes uh, more sustainable dyes insect pest management i was talking about like malaria carrying mosquitoes and termites and things like that um i actually have two jars of of uh of grain spawn uh crawling all over some some um cockroaches that i found in my house and using that as as eco pest management for cockroaches instead of chemicals psilocybin you know for for depression anxiety end of life care i mean huge 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 uh space health pharma with functional mushrooms and then also isolating compounds for new drugs, um, space travel, construction, batteries, fashion, culture, education. There's so much that fungi can do to help the world. And we're on the frontier, y'all. And y'all are tuning in, shrooming in. Y'all are part of it. You're surfing the wave. And so going back to, you know, making the world a better place, we plant a tree for every product that we sell. And that's something like really dear to my heart. Um, the picture to the left is actually a, a picture from one of our tree planting campaigns in Rwanda. We plant most of our trees in, in, the Peruvian Amazon rainforest in Madre de Dios, but this 
Um, we have a bunch of other locations all around the world. So, um, so we planted a thousand trees in Rwanda. And if anyone has a chance to go, Rwanda is a beautiful, gorgeous place. The people are awesome. Um, you get the silverback gorillas there. The food is great. Uh, you get the longest stretch of speed bumps in the world, which is funny to drive over. And uh, it's literally like miles and miles of speed bumps. It's really crazy. And um, also just donating, you know, herbal extracts. We've donated over 15,000 herbal extracts to um, by POC communities in the, in, in the U.S. just alone during COVID. Uh, you know, dietary supplements are expensive. So, you know, for people who can't afford it, uh, we want to give back and, and make it free and accessible and then like, you know, get back to the earth. We don't want to revive just the human body, but the, the planet earth. And, um, and part of that is just like being an ethical business and, and, you know, all of our employees get minimum three times the minimum wage with full benefits. Um, the average employee makes 1.44 times as much as the CEO, which is me. And, uh, you know, typically CEOs make it, it's like average around 664 uh, times more than the average worker, uh, up to a thousand times, which is like insane. Uh, but you know, I, I don't want to be the highest paid person. Um, and I, I want everyone to, you know, um, you're the have a livelihood and, uh, we have 20% higher than average employees that are women, um, which is half of our workforce and 28% higher than average percent of, of women owners in, in mushroom revival. Uh, so that's something that I'm proud of and we can do way better, but it's just a start and, and just being transparent about it. Um, and, and then another thing that we're really passionate about is just mushrooming the culture around mushrooms and, and bringing on experts from all around the world to bridge that gap. Uh, because people get so into mushrooms and get really passionate, but then kind of fall short on access to information. Uh, they they read mycelium running, they see the videos, and then you know they get a few more books, and then you know the next step is is it's really heady scientific literature, and it's like whoa, uh, and they kind of tap out there. So the the gap is huge and we wanted to bridge that and, and, uh, kind of put the spot spotlight on like really awesome people around the world doing cool stuff. This is our new album cover, um, that is going to launch pretty soon. Uh, next week we have a video component coming soon, um, where we're, we're trying to make like mini documentaries every week. Uh, and so we'll add in like all these pictures and videos and animations and, and really just like an, minimum an hour a week just diving in with with an expert from around the world on a specific topic and uh and just having the visual component help um and so that that's something that we're super super excited about and um just want to give back to to people and just make it free like i don't i don't want to accept i mean like yeah we have products i got to pay my bills but um i don't want to make any of the education um monetized and so uh and so like for this talk, for example, they offered to pay me and I'm not accept, accepting a dime. I don't, I don't, it, I love when people geek out about mushrooms and like, that is something that I want more people to do. Uh, right and I'll, I'll give a, a quick intro to our podcast. Just. Hey, Alex, is there supposed to be sound? I'm not sure if you're sharing your screen sound. Oh, it's all good. There's a catchy theme song, and okay. you'll hear it in like a week. It's but, beautiful um, visuals. A little shameless promotion, and no I'll worries. just bring it back to everyone uh, that I am super blessed that people are geeking out about mushrooms, and I'm super happy that people are tuning in from all over the country or world and making the world a better place with mushrooms. And, you know, I'm, I'm always here if you want to reach out, um, you know, if you need help with anything or just want to geek out about mushrooms, need, you know, uh, any resources, uh, any, you know, book recommendations, things like that, um, you know, because we're all in it together and we're barely scratching the surface of, of mushrooms and, 
You know, I, I always tell people, I'll end with this. People always ask me like, you know, mushrooms can do, mushrooms can do all these things. Where do I start? And really it's anywhere. Uh, you can be a leader in the field and push this industry to another level wherever you choose to land because we know so little about fungi and mycology that if you put even even a year minimum you know you can do something new that no one in the history of the planet has ever done with fungi so thank you everyone for tuning in much love yeah thank you um Sorry, talking over you, Bruce. Um, yeah, do we, we want to go to questions now? And uh, and we're about to go where if you want, you don't want your video on screen, just um, turn that off and then that'll be fine. But you can still ask your question and whatnot. And if you don't want to talk on the stream, just ask it in the chat and we'll ask it. Yeah, so Bruce, you have your hand up. And then, yeah, uh, let's keep it a little orderly. Raise your hand and, and Zoom to, to get in like a line. And so Bruce is first, so. Okay, well, I want to thank you for the presentation. Extremely informative. Um, I think uh, it helps uh, many people uh, who are new to this um, to come into the fold, uh, open their minds and uh, explore what the universe is offering us. So I applaud you for that and um, thank you immensely for that. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of topics. Um, lately, <laughs> the AI thing, um, you know, uh, is embedded. Um, it's not my focus. Um, I know what the practitioners uh, are looking for there. Um, and this ties into mycology on a subconscious level, um, because within each of us, um, we are able to tap into our subconscious. I do it through meditation, and uh, I can reach interiors of my brain, which create algebraic algorithms to open up new avenues to travel in a multi-dimensional uh, fashion. In other words, outside this 3D uh, physical realm in which we live. That allows me access to um, take in new knowledge unknown to humankind and um, not that I understand it all, at once, a lot of times it, it seems like a download of sorts that um, needs to be processed through experience and new knowledge. But um, nonetheless, the AI trip through uh, the techno industry wants to subvert that. Um, if you look at social media, if you look at all the algorithms involved. What, with what's your question, Bruce? It kind of rambling on a little bit. Sorry to kind of cut you well, off. I'm there. just trying to lay a groundwork. Um, yeah, but we have other we have other people who want to ask questions here, so we want to okay. kind of get to the point. Sorry, sorry to like I understand you're trying to go, but yeah. All right. Um, I guess the question would be. Uh, do you feel that, uh, you know, the mycological link between the subconscious thought process? Pardon? Keep going. The mycological link between the subconscious thought process and the ability to gain knowledge outside of artificial intelligence is valid. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not an AI expert and I think, you know, we're all, uh, for my philosophy, we're all one, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, we, 
at, at one level, you know, there is no separation from us and anything else. And so artificial or like uh, natural versus man-made, I mean, like it's all the same thing if you boil it down in like a nihilist perspective, but that's a whole, like we can, you know, uh, go down that rabbit hole for like eight years. Um, I, I'm not an AI expert and I think we should all keep eating mushrooms and uh, figure it out together. <laughs> But I would love to learn more. And um, I just, yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm equipped to answer that question. I concur with that. Um, and then the only other thing was, I just wanted to know if you had any comments on um, psychosomatic uh, microphagy and the use uh, therapeutically to treat, um, you know, symptoms of PTSD. Um, I am starting a clinic in Oregon uh, since they have just passed a resolution to legalize the use of psilocybin for therapeutic uses. And um, I, I think it's an important uh, uh, affront. And I was just wondering what your comments are regarding that. And um, what I, my conclusions are that the uh, derivatives, the, extra, the extractions from fruiting bodies are better than um, from the mycelia. Um, Paul seems to have a different opinion about it, but that's fine. That's Paul, you know. But, um, anyways, just wondering what your thoughts were regarding that. Yeah, I think is I think it's huge, and I I, you know, I, I I think more medicine to more people, to be honest. And and part of me, obviously, has like a. Uh, a disdain towards the the capitalist drive for like psilocybin and to you know at, at least some of the people I see coming in some of the people I see coming in like are awesome people and I'm like go for it you're you know it, it, to create that space um and then from another perspective if I want to anthropomorphize mushrooms I'm like they don't give they don't care they just want in in as many mouths as possible and so if you blow it up mainstream they're like great I get to brainwash as many humans as possible and like do my bidding. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't, you know, we'll see how it unfolds and, but I think it's, it's huge nonetheless. And if you're going to monetize anything and, and make it big business, like might as well do it with something that has huge effects, like huge positive effects on people's lives. Like it's kind of hard to fuck it up. Because the mushrooms will do the work, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, I, I, I think there's integrity to go into it. And, and like, yeah, just like cannabis, like a lot of, you know, white males with a lot of money come in and they make a bunch of money. And like this, this, it, that's a whole debate that we could have a two hour long conversation about. But um, well, this would not, I, it, the clinic would not be monetized. It would be a nonprofit designation. Um, which allows it to get funding from the government eventually when the government decides they want to fund these sorts of programs. And um, it's not a money-making thing. It's all about helping humankind. And, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm sorry to cut you out. I think overall it's great. Um, yeah, I, I think yeah. it's good too. And pushing for stuff like Medicare for all and more universal healthcare systems will help make that type of medicine more accessible to everybody. Uh, ACO, is that I say that right? Yeah, you have a question? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hey. Um, hey. Uh, oh, you got muted. Am I back? Yeah, you're, you're back. back. Okay. Um, shoot, now I'm forgetting. Oh, okay. So I had a, a couple of quick questions. One of them, um, you'd mentioned uh, how... Uh, Chitin kind of inhibits, I guess. Um, oh, you cut out again. I heard chitin inhibits. And that's yeah. It. Yeah. Sort of our, our ability. I wonder why it's doing that. Anyway, our ability to sort of process some of these, you know, medicinal compounds. Um, I, I would think, I guess, ideally, we'd just be eating a crap ton of mushrooms all day, every day. Um, but do you think sort of in a practical sense, if, if you're trying to um, 
I guess benefit uh, from mushrooms. Is it better to better to like consume the extracts over just trying to eat pounds and pounds of mushrooms every day? It depends on your end goal. You know, if if you're looking for medicinal benefit, then extracts are the way to go. Um, but I, you know, don't stop eating mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> like mushrooms are great to cook and throw it in your stir fries and soups and things. Like, don't stop doing that. Uh, and there's there's so much more healing than just like the compounds. You know, looking for mushrooms, cooking mushrooms, that's healing in and of itself. To to chop and make your own food, like fuck yeah, like that's awesome. Or like to go out in the woods and find mushrooms, like that is medicine in and of itself. So I, I, I'm, I have to put on many different hats. So like the scientist is like, oh, the compounds, but then like my more spiritual self is like, oh, like you know, it, it's way beyond that. Uh, but with with mushrooms for cooking, you should always cook them, and that breaks down the chitin. And the chitin is kind of the outside wall. And you can think of it that, like these compounds are hiding inside. And so you got to break open the walls so they get released. That's, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, uh, just a couple more quick ones. Uh, you mentioned, I think briefly, I, I don't know if I heard it correctly, but something about how the hyphal knots for psilocybin mushrooms might be uh, better or... Yeah, I, if you listen to, uh, we have an episode um, called The Ecology of Psilocybin on our podcast, and it's an awesome episode that talks about like the evolution of psilocybin in general and like the the uh, symbiosis with insects and, and that sort of thing that I touched on the, the beginning. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the compound. I, I want to say it's norbiocystin, but... Um, Beta carboline, it's beta carboline. I think uh, is is a is basically an MAOI, um, and they're they're more highly concentrated in the specific psilocybin species in the hyphal tip. Huh. Um, that being said, I don't know if that I don't think it's psilocybin cubensis. I, I think it's another species, but. Listening to the podcast, there's a whole transcript as well, so you can actually like command F um, and try to find it pretty quickly, and it should show up in the text. And I believe we have a resources section that actually links the paper. Um, and if you reach out via email, I can actually send. If you can't find it, I'll send you the paper. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And um, anyone else too, if who's interested. And sorry, I don't want to take all the time. You, um, you, you you kind of went through a, a short list of um, the functional uh, mushrooms and I, you know, I recognize most of them, but I think there are a couple that I, that I miss. I don't know if it's easy to go back to the slideshow really quick. Uh, if not, that's fine. You could always check the, the video will be up on YouTube. You could always just go back oh. and find the spot again oh, and, and you can screenshot, do whatever, take notes, leave comments, leave lots of comments y'all. Okay. Uh, okay, great. And then I guess just the last thing is it was a really great talk and I appreciate it. It was very informative. So. Oh, hell yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank and you. don't, don't apologize. You're awesome. Like keep <laughs> asking questions. Don't apologize for asking questions. That's great. Take up space and ask questions. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. And, and also mind. reach out anytime if, if like, you know, you go through that list, you've, you, you don't, you don't know a specific mushroom or anything or, uh, want some more resources. I'm always happy to help. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Who's next? Anybody else got a question? Nathan, you, you, you got one? Go for it, man. Sure. Yeah. Like, you know, I've been um, gathering a ton of mushrooms and fungi. Um, I have made various tinctures you know, I've also looked at like CBD extraction and, and I'm spending like 80% of my time researching and 20% of my time doing. And so, you know, what I'm really looking for is like some general rules of thumb, like, um, like Aiko was talking about like, uh, extraction versus eating. So like, you know, like general rule of thumb, uh, for like water extraction and then alcohol extraction or alcohol extraction 
and then water extraction. And then of course, eating those fruiting bodies after both of those are done, you know, if it's like a lion's mane or something. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing like your thoughts on like just some general rules about that. Uh, obviously it's going to differ like Grishi, lion's mane, chaga, birch polypore, which you're not going to eat, you know, like, but like your oh, you can eat that. thoughts, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. And this is, this is like, we don't know anything um, or at least I don't. And, and I, I've tried to dig through all the research papers that I, I can have access to. And from what I can see, it's just like the materia medica for mushrooms is like almost non-existent. Um, or it's just not as built out as other herbs are. Um, and there is a lot of information on some mushrooms more than others, like a lot of information on reishi, but not as much on say lion's mane or cordyceps. Uh, and so most herbalists that you, you, you talk to, they'll say, you know, use as high, the highest grade alcohol that you can find like 95% alcohol, uh, soak it in a tincture for 30 days and then make a tea for a couple hours and then combine it to like 35%. But that's like all mushrooms. Uh, but if you, if you really like ask an herbalist, every herb is obviously different. And so we just, I don't know, uh, don't, it's not as common knowledge for mushrooms. However, you know, what to go first, the water versus alcohol. Um, I recommend the alcohol, well, um, if you can do them both at the same time, it's actually the best. So if, uh, you can do it with like, a, <clears throat> um, if you have a hot plate, you can have like a stainless steel pot and, uh, do it together. Um, if that makes sense. And so any alcohol you use will have a water content. And so if you heat it up, it'll it'll both act as a tea and an alcohol extract at the same time. Does that make sense? And you can use yeah. things like a bee extractor, um, which is like just, it's just a big stainless steel vat with like a spinny thing or yeah, like, I've seen, uh, I've, I've seen something on that. And I, I forget the, you know, the point at which alcohol, um, you know, it's like 173 maybe, but that's just from memory. I'm not, not exactly sure. Yeah. You want to keep it below, like 130 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit, or else it'll evaporate. Um, if you want, you can make it airtight. Uh, we've done some airtight hot ethanol extractions, and I mean, just and, don't make a bomb. But <laughs> and as long as we're on this point, um, like, have you heard? Like, maybe with chaga and a couple of others, they talk about freezing and unfreezing. And maybe that, I, I don't know if it's because it breaks the cell walls, but any thoughts on freezing and unfreezing? I think it's uh, with alcohol extractions. Primarily. Yeah, I. there's no need. I could see why someone would do it um, to break kind of the cell walls, but I don't see the need to. I know some people freeze to kill insects um, or larva. It's kind of like euthanasia for larva if you like wild harvest mushrooms. Um, but I can also see that having an effect on the cell wall, but there, you know, and then some, some mushrooms have more water soluble compounds than alcohol. Some have more alcohol soluble. Um, and then there's like way more solvents. Um, so there's like CO2, there's ultra, uh, sonic assisted, there's methane or methanol. There's like you know, glycerin. I mean, there's a ton of different, there's apple cider vinegar. There's a t most people use hot water and alcohol. Um, and if you could do it all at once, that's the best. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple questions from the chat. Do you know common usage for medicinal mushrooms, or do you know how common the usage of medicinal mushrooms is in China and like per capita usage? And 
obviously you can probably compare that to the United States and make it look pretty sad. <laughs> I wish. No, I, I do know like a couple of statistics on, you know, there's like over 70,000 patents on reishi, for example. And then in the US, there's like 30. So, you know, um, and then there's other statistics on like how many research papers and, um, you know, 80% of, of gourmet mushrooms are grown in China, um, the world's mushroom supply. Uh, you know, mushrooms have been used medicinally for over 5,000 years in China. I mean, I don't know per capita or how common, like I know Asteria cicadiae, like 25% of, of China in that one study ha has eaten it in like a soup or something like that. But um, yeah, that's, that's all the statistics that I know off the top of my head. Cool. Um, and so this one, a couple of micro remediation questions. Do you have any, do you have any info as to creating targeted strains for micro remediation? Like just building them up to a toxic site or something like that? Yeah, I, I talk about it in my book, so you can download it for free. Um, if you go to mushroomrevival.com in the resources uh, section, um, you can uh, you can download it there, and then and then it's a PDF, so you can control find. Um, so some people like that better uh, because it's more of like a reference guide. Um, but th uh, that book is more like grassroots style. It's obviously different on on more of an industrial scale. Um, Hopefully that answered your question. And so a few more on the on that line. Have you ever looked at using wax worms to eat the plastic waste from mushroom farming, like the the micro bags, that kind of stuff? One more thing on the micromediation question. Most industrial micromediation actually uses um uh what do you call it? Um uh genetically engineered strains of uh fungi to and and that's like I'm, I don't know much about GMOs and and that sort of thing, but it in that instance I feel like I'm okay with it if it's if it's used for cleaning up toxic waste. And then um, the worms for plastic, I've heard some worms eating styrofoam. I don't know how good that is for them. Um, like I think there's soldier fly larva. We actually have a soldier fly larva farm like. 20 feet away that eel are compost and they're great uh if anyone wants yeah. a good compost companion but um i think it's them I, I could be wrong but it could be another worm um they don't the the plastic used in mushroom farming is uh is polypropylene number five and it's one of the hardest plastics to break down and so a worm is not going to eat that um no bacteria can break that down no fungi can break that down and this the evolution of plastics they actually um buried early plastics in the soil had fungi and bacteria colonize it then cultured those fungi and bacteria to make the plastics resistant to those strains and they just kept making new plastics and new plastics so um but uh, bi biology will catch up and so we're like you know i just read the paper that we found like you know like 200 different strains of fungi that can, can degrade um, really like low uh, forms of plastic. And people just scour like um, uh, landfills and they, they look for partly degraded plastic in the soil and then they culture it in the lab, see what fungi is growing on it. And um, they can genetically engineer uh, those strains, see the, the pathway, the enzyme pathways and uh, make them better. Um, things like that, uh, but um, cool. Yeah, we still have a long, long way to go. Yeah, lots to learn. Um, does nicotine on the cigarette butts cause any problems for the mushrooms when you're growing them in your ashtray? I don't know. I didn't see any problem. They they ripped through them. They loved it. Cool. Didn't that seem like it? <laughs> I mean, they're probably yeah. just eating it up with everything else. Oyster mushrooms yeah, will eat anything. Yeah. It probably kept the other uh, pests and things out. That's why it went for seven flushes. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. Good point. 
um, with making tinctures. Uh, oh, this is a hard question to read. Uh, sorry, whoever asked it is too difficult. Doesn't make any sense to me. Um, do you want to copy and paste it in the chat? Maybe I can. Yeah, I guess I can do that. It's really weird. Oh, wait, no, it's about sequencing alcohol and water. You already answered it. Someone else. Okay, that cool. So, um, someone's asking if you're looking for investors, but they're on YouTube. So I don't know if, how serious of an inquiry that is. But you never know. Hit them up, Jack Mo. Yeah, I would, I would reach out. <laughs> More money we, uh, is never a problem for businesses, right? Yeah, we are currently completely self-funded, but we will probably open around next year for our, uh, yeah. There you go. Let's see. I'm trying to, f oh yeah, just more about that. Oh, they're actually in asking about investing in more sustainable farming in general also. So if you, you have anything to speak on that, just like kind of more ethical investment, I don't know. I mean, I have my personal inclinations, but this is a podcast for people to come speak their mind, not mine. So. Organic Farm Association. Uh, when you say in investing, I, and maybe hopefully they're listening to whoever wrote that, but um, when you say investing, do you mean it? specific companies to invest into or it, that's what it kind of sounds like they had they had asked this question a little bit earlier in the evening and i told the people on the youtube and everything that i would ask their questions when we got around to asking the questions so i'm not sure if they're still in the chat to to ask more follow-ups okay. i know um, there's some um, you know similar kind of it's like an eco-friendly s p 500 where they collect all eco-friendly kind of brand uh, companies together that you can invest um, and they just kind of switch it out. Um, I know the fees are ridiculous and it probably is not worth it, but if, if that, make, uh, what was that, that Bruce, Did I make a comment. Yeah, go for it. Um, the organic farmers association is a group of, uh, organic farmers throughout the nation and part of the world. Um, that relies solely on donations through, uh, like, for example, I work at a natural grocer's uh, health food store, and we have a campaign every year to use money into their program. And uh, with, uh, each and every dollar, they're able to buy up land that has been used in the traditional sense, um, meaning the green revolution, as opposed to organic. And so they are converting these dollars into new acreage for organic farming. And I think it's absolutely important to recognize that and uh you know make efforts to give people that way of of change uh yeah. to me it's critical and um uh, the only way we can do it this is not for an investment purpose it's not for anything like that um, this is simply to help out humankind, and um, I am all for it. And I implore everybody to check out OFA and uh, you know make a donation. Yeah, that sounds really good. And I think um, really bringing to the forefront of people's minds that a lot of government subsidies go to specifically fund that type of agriculture. And if we want to, we can apply political pressure to get that funding shifted to organic gardeners and farmers and small farmers and small mushroom farmers and that kind of stuff too because a lot Absolutely. of our industrial agriculture is already propped up by yeah. the federal government uh so moving on to a question about the cordyceps how long does it take to start feeling the effects of your cordyceps energy and then i'm not sure how the, the follow-up question is a little interesting so i'm going to ask it um, how many two ounce bottles would I need to get me there? 
<laughs> it depends on the person. So we have people that feel it within, you know, uh, 10 seconds and they're like, wow, I, you know, it's kind of like a windshield wiper sort of thing to, uh, your brain fog. And you're just like, wow, I just feel a little more energy. Sometimes it takes 30 minutes. Sometimes, you know, you're taking it a couple times a day and it takes a couple weeks. Um, everyone reacts differently to everything, you know, um, some people smoke weed and it makes them super anxious. Some people, uh, it makes them super chill. Um, some people can't drink coffee. Some people drink like three pots a day. Um, everyone is different and everyone reacts to compounds differently. Um, so I wish there was a one size fit all, but, but there's not. Cool. Um, and that's all the rest of the question. So um, well, is yeah. So, what's the best way to follow up with you if people wanted to reach out to you to get you to come do a talk or, or yeah. So, what's the best way to get a hold of you? If if you want to reach out to support at mushroomrevival dot com, uh, that's probably the best way. And uh, we have a whole team of awesome, knowledgeable people that can help. And if if it's specifically me, uh, then then. Uh, they can put you in contact with me. But if it's an easy answer that uh, they can answer, then um, sometimes I feel like they're they're smarter than me. So, <laughs> Hey, Alex, just a quick question. Are you down in Texas or are you still up in Massachusetts? I am. I just, uh, I moved. I moved in, um, in uh, late May, early June. I'm in Austin in Travis Heights in South Congress area and um, just bought a house which is nuts. First time I don't have roommates, which is the craziest thing in the world. And uh, love it here. It's freaking awesome. I can't wait to not have snow for the first time in my life. I'm, I'm yeah. oh my God, it's freaking awesome. I just am outside all the time. Um, Welcome to the dry though. <laughs> yeah, it's hot. We moved like right in the heat of it all. And yeah, totally. Um, I didn't, People are like, oh, you don't know heat. And I'm like, oh, I love saunas and things like that. It is another type of heat. Um, oh. You just are sweating. Humid. I didn't know I could take this many showers. I'm like <laughs> constantly feel like I need to take a shower. Yeah, um, but it. I love it here. It's awesome. And um, down to go mushroom hunting with anyone socially distanced and uh, get, grab some tacos uh, or not. Um, well, congrats on the move. Sorry to hear you're so far away now, but um, oh, are you in Massachusetts? Uh, are you in the I, Northeast? I actually met you at uh, Kay's uh, Permaculture Design Certification thing. Yeah, I'm I'm upstate New York. Cool. You look super Ooh, familiar. Yeah. yeah, I was I was like, yeah, we definitely met before. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I'm. I'll probably head back up to the Northeast for some things, but I'm glad I'm out, I'm out of the winter. <laughs> <laughs> and you're welcome here as well. So any anytime you're in Austin, yeah, I might take you uh, up on that. I have friends in Austin. Uh, it's, I've been there a few times. It's it's a great spot. Congrats. Yeah, and I saw one comment. Someone asked when we're gonna go mushroom hunting. So um, I don't know. It's a weird time. Um, it's yeah, a weird weird time. 2020, but um, yeah. Hopefully we can social distance, wear masks, and be very far apart in in the woods and um look for mushrooms because yeah ctms yeah. organized one and did like kept it you know really really small like around 10 people and that seemed to work just fine so i think if people want to do that uh you know members have access to the discord server and they can kind of organize yourself to meet up in small groups that way you know i would highly recommend that um and then as soon as we can we'll try and get some more more formal things going but you know i guess they got good news on the vaccine so maybe we'll be out of this thing soon so i didn't realize y'all have a lot of entomopathogenic fungi or like cordyceps i just found one like on our patio really um, we yeah I, like an I, I, like yeah i that's like what ali told me that when you 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 told her that when like you found one like when you first got here and i was like what the heck like yeah so within, that's definitely something we want you to get like a foray we want to do 
as soon as possible because i mean like part of what we want to do with the society is kind of help develop these technologies and and have them be uh be community resources and like have the patents owned through a co-op and, and stuff like that so um and help develop them and make them accessible to people without you know kind of help build up that infrastructure for the community as opposed to siloing siloing it in capital like tends to happen with a lot of these things so oh no you're frozen Am I frozen? No, I think you're good. Okay, someone, it's, Alex is frozen. So I am gonna switch us off the stream and if Alex comes back, uh, we can hear, but I'm gonna do my little membership pitch and then, uh, yeah. Um, do, do, do uh awesome everybody so thank you for tuning in tonight to the, our central texas mycological society monthly lecture we do these every month on the third thursday uh if you would like to support uh this type of programming and, and want to help spread the word about fungi considering becoming a member at central texas uh, we have student memberships just general memberships and uh and family memberships so yeah go on down and sign up and that helps us do more stuff like this, helps us grow the community out. Um, and hopefully when COVID's over, we'll be doing a lot more really cool stuff. Um, yeah, membership gets you access to a private discord for the community to talk without all the Facebook riffraff and all that stuff. So sorry, Facebook folks who are tuned in still. Become a member for exclusive access. Uh, and yeah. Lots of questions being answered in the Discord and, and, and all that fun stuff. We need more people and yeah, so become a member today, centraltexasmycology.org. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all the different platforms. And yeah, thank you so much for tuning in.